Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Origin Stories. <laughs> Thank everybody for joining us on a wonderful Saturday afternoon. I am excited about uh, today's guest. Um, <laughs> And I want to thank everybody from both channels that have joined us. Uh, my name is uh, Denver Stevo. I am here from the Denver Stevo channel. Uh, and our guest, uh, Matt Pesh, uh, who will be joining us in just a second, is uh, joining us from the Queen Bee SP channel. Um, as we know, uh, Matt and Amy have uh, have been doing quite a bit of work uh uh, both on and off screen here, not just lately, but uh, for years. So I um, wanted to, while everybody, uh, as everybody is joining in, if you are joining in from Denver Stevo, please uh, swing over and check out Queen BSP. Uh, make sure that you're uh, subscribed to that channel and also uh, like this uh, program on that channel as well. Uh, and for those of you over at Queen BSP over on Amy and Matt's channel, please swing on over to at Denver Stevo, come on over, like this show, and uh, most definitely, uh, most definitely subscribe. You are, you are all welcome, and uh, we love, uh, we love the SPTV family. So, um, a little bit about myself, very quick. I am, uh, I am one of the never ends. Um, as the story goes, uh, in this, uh, in this global world of ours, there are seven point six billion never ends but only a few of us that have a youtube channel well that's not true i guess every never end that has a youtube channel whether they're they know they're a never in or not has a channel but um i got into uh, i got into this story like many um i think my my acknowledgement of the story came from uh from uh, Leah Remini Scientology in the aftermath several years ago, but, uh, but the Scientology story has kind of always been there with, uh, you know, Tom Cruise yelling at, uh, um, um Matt Lauer <laughs> or jumping on Oprah's, ch uh, jumping on Oprah's couch. Um, and as somebody who has always grown up being uh, very, very against, um, abuse um abuses of abuses towards people um i'm i'm an animal lover and uh, as much of an activist there as i can be as well uh it was just something that uh this story just kind of kept uh kept grabbing onto me over the years and uh, it kept finding me as well um leah's show was over and then all of a sudden there's a podcast and then all of a sudden uh, Aaron Smith Levin's channel starts popping up in my YouTube feeds and it just it snowballed in my life to a point where uh, it just made it just made sense it was certainly it felt like a calling to stand behind our uh, our ex Scientologists our former Scientologist friends uh, as a megaphone to their voice so that's what brought me here um, and here we are so <laughs> But with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is time. <laughs> Let's bring out, and please, there's two things that I want from you in the chat, if, if you don't mind. One, as you go into the chat and say hi, please let us know where you're from as well. Uh, it would be uh, huge for us to uh, know where all of, our, uh, all of our viewers are popping in from today. Uh, I know that's something that uh, Amy has loved to do, and it's uh, something that I've always been curious of as well. So please throw that in there. Um, and then uh, as I as I introduce uh, and as I bring out our guest, uh, please throw in the chat all those applause emojis that you can. Uh, and let's put our hands together for the one, the only, the King Bee himself, Matt Pesh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too much. Hello, everyone. Too much? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you here, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, good to be here. Hey, so we have got uh, we have got a gang and a half. Look at that. We're already uh, we're already flying high past the uh, the hundred viewer mark. People want to hear the story. So, um, before we before we dive in, how's the day been for you? That's yeah, going great. Yeah, 
Wonderful, wonderful. It's uh, it's a beautiful, snowy, <laughs> yes, I say snowy, afternoon here in the uh, nondescript Colorado mountain town where uh, where I where I bode from here. So I'm uh, I'm enjoying my first day of snow. So yay! <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's in the 80s here. We were just watching people water ski. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. <laughs> The funny part is, uh, it snowed this morning, and and uh, in my front yard, it's already in the front side of the house. It's already all melted. In the back side of the house, there's still some snow. So it's uh, it'll be gone by tomorrow. We'll get another batch at some point, but uh, yeah, it'll be back up into the 70s here pretty quick. So, but wow, water skiing. Uh, wow, I want to water ski. I haven't water ski. <laughs> well, you can snow ski. I can snow ski. I can't. No, no, I can't. No, I, <laughs> I can't. Uh, so that <laughs> we're all here today. And, and, and I think the part of the thing that I forgot to mention in my introduction here, we call this show origin stories for, for a particular reason. This is not a story about, uh, our guests, uh, Scientology days. We, 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 the Scientology. So a couple of things. The Scientology stories are stories that that tend to come out in many a chat. Um, but what doesn't tend to come out are those stories, the 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 lead-ins. What got us into Scientology? What what was the what was life like before then? And since we're talking here about ex-Scientologists, there's of course that second part of the story. Um, what's been going on after so that's kind of where our focus where our focus will be today just to to let the uh to let the full audience know if they're not familiar with uh, this program um also don't forget swing over to denver stevo and check out our first interview with mitch brisker um but yeah that's that's really the the what we target this this story about plus and i don't know if i'm i'm starting trouble here rumor has it in the future there may be a Matt Pesh pen to paper, and we don't want to blow all of the good stuff by uh, by stealing it all here. Right. Yeah, I've been working real hard on that book re recently. That's for sure. That's fantastic. I am uh, I, I'm a fan of every. I mean, one, I'm a fan, but uh, two, I can't wait to. You know, I. I having read Mark's book and, and having read, uh, having read Amy's book, um, you know, there's, there's, there's all these stories in there that you just, th there's always stories that you don't expect and always parts of life where you were, Oh my God, you guys did, you went through that. And, uh, um, just from the bits, the, the tales that you've told, uh, on, on other streams and, and, uh, in other uh, venues, um, I can't wait to find out what I don't know about uh, <laughs> about the Matt Pesh Scientology life, but uh, but we'll stay we'll stay uh, we won't avoid it. We're, we're never one to avoid the topics, but uh, we'll really keep that focus today on uh, on kind of the, the 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 other ends of it, right? Well, before and after Scientology. So uh, that being said, um, how'd life start for Matt Pesh? Well, I guess uh, <clears throat> I was born uh, on Long Island, New York, okay. on uh, the South Shore in a town called North Babylon. And it's about three miles from the Great South Bay. <laughs> so uh, we were always fishing. We were always going to the beach, the ocean, uh, always playing sports. Um, typical middle class Long Island uh, situation. Nice. You know, my dad, he worked in Queens for Con Edison. He was a troubleshooter working from a, a truck, climbing poles, you know, telephone poles and, and doing all that kind of stuff. He never wanted to work in an office. Uh, my mom was from the Bronx, so she was kind of the enforcer in the house. You know, she, she did all the discipline. My dad was like, left all that to my mom. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how it went. You know, my mom kind of passed on the way that she was raised in the Bronx. You know, I'd be like five years old going to school for the first time and my mom is putting up her hand wants me to punch her hand as hard as i can and she's you know she's like have me punch your hand punch your hand she goes okay if anybody tries to bully you she's like getting me set up for kindergarten if anybody tries to bully you you need to hit them right in the middle of their face as hard as they can i don't care what happens after that how big they are but you don't want to 
make yourself like somebody that the bullies want to go after. And that was kind of her, her, you know, mentality. And she told me, I have my little Bullwinkle, you know, lunch box there. And she's telling me if I ever see a brother or sister in a fight and I don't jump in, no matter how many people there are, she tells me, don't come home. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm like, Oh shucks. You know, like, Am I like heading off to war here or what? You know, like don't come home. I'm five years old, you know. But that's that's kind of how the, the mentality was. And it's that's kind of a Long Island mentality a lot too. I tell you the tell you the truth, you know. So that's sure. kind of how things started up there. So so mom was definitely the uh what's the <laughs> I'm putting up. She was the muscle, yeah, yeah. She was the muscle, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. There we go. If we were making noise in the house and she took that wooden spoon and slapped it on the uh the little nightstand next to our bed, that was like that's the last warning, kids. You know, next time I get up, your ass is gonna be on fire, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> Wow. So you you said you uh, you said you played a lot of sports uh, growing up or played sports growing up. Was there a favorite? Anything you? Uh... Uh, probably wrestling. You know, I really like wrestling. It's you know, I did everything though. Every sport I did: gymnastics and track and you know, football and baseball and F, you know, hockey. Anything I could play, I was playing. If it wasn't on an organized team, then it was you know, just in the streets playing. But uh, I like wrestling. I wrestled for six years. I started off at seventy eight pounds. In seventh grade, I was a skinny little kid. Mm-hmm. And then next year, I was 88 and 98. I didn't get into, until high school. I wasn't even over 100 pounds. I didn't wrestle over 100 pounds until 10th grade. So and then wow. I started growing and putting on weight and all that good stuff. But yeah, I, so I like wrestling. Okay. I, uh, I wrestled. I was not good. <laughs> not at all. But, uh, <laughs> and in the early years, cause I was, I was the opposite of you. I was the big guy. Um, I, uh, there were, there were, there were tournaments where I would go and I was apparently, um, a little bit bigger than I should have been. And, uh, I would, I would walk off with, uh, I would walk off with a trophy after having like wrestled, uh, one match, you know, there was one other guy. Okay. Well, there we go. We've, here's our, <laughs> here's our weight class, uh, champion, uh, championship for the, for the week. So yeah, it was, uh, but, uh, it was, uh, it was a great sport. It, uh, I, I definitely, uh, definitely know where you're coming from with the, uh, with the enjoyment there. What about, uh, what about, uh, um, what studies, what about classes? How, how'd you do in school? How was I did. I did really good in school. You know, I really took uh, school seriously. I would uh, always do my homework, and my mom would drill me. You know, she would uh, check me out on mathematics, and she had it so that you know I can go all the way up to as a little kid, go up to twelve times twelve, and just snap answer what it was, and all that kind of stuff that she did with me really helped me in school. And uh, I graduated with high honors, and when I took the test for college, it was across the top, all the you know two percent of the country, and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I did good in school. I, I like school. Wow, they got to ask the same question for that. What was your favorite? Uh, um, what was your favorite subject? I like math because it only has one answer. You know, everybody has opinions <laughs> on all the other stuff. You know, but two plus two is four. There's no, there's no way you can kind of get cheated out of what you should get as a mark. I kind of like that. Fair enough. <laughs> Such a great, yeah, yeah, right. It's uh, it's it's that simple. Um, what uh we all end uh, so okay so so school so so great in classes love the sports um what else was there anything else in your uh in in those years that uh kind of made uh yeah. kind of was what else what else was going on during your uh during your your you know your teen and, and high school years okay well, we'll check i think uh Something that should be said is when I went to kindergarten, I had all this extra energy, you know, and, and the, the kindergarten teacher was like, you know, we need to like slow this kid down a little bit, you know. So she told my mom, when he gets home from school, take a, a big book, you know, some kind of novel or something like that and read that to him for a while until he kind of settles down and then let him go out and play. So my mom, she grabbed uh, books from Jack London, which she knew I would be interested in, you know, mm-hmm. something like I could like be interested in as a little kid she uh we read uh call the wild and white fang and sea wolf and i became a real fan of jack london i got a book that had all his short stories and essays and it was like three three inches thick and i read that and i kind of dreamed of being like jack london you know he was taking rafts down the mississippi and he was 
yeah. you know, looking for gold in the Yukon. And, and, you know, so I had that in mind when I was 10 years old, I'm walking home from a uh, little league and I got my little league uniform on and all that playing baseball. And I see uh, this hippie kind of guy. He's by the, the highway there in New York, and he's on the exit, and he's hitchhiking. And I said, hey, where are you going, right? And he said, uh, oh, I'm just going to travel. I'm just traveling the world, you know? And I said, oh. I said, wait for me. I said, I got to run home. I got to change. I got a little bit of money. I got to grab it and stuff like that. I said, don't leave without me. I was real emphatic. Don't leave without me. I'll be right back. I ran home as fast as I could. I changed. I got you know my stuff. I ran back to the highway and he was gone. And I was like, oh man. But that was my mentality. I was like, I wanted to go check out the world. I wanted to get out of that, you know? And uh, yeah, so that was that was where I was in my mind. It sounds like foreshadowing to me. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Excellent. So, okay. So, so you want to travel the world. Was there, did you get the chance while you were, while you were growing up, I guess, for me, and you know, I, I think for a lot of us, getting out in the world means going on trips with our family. Did you? Do you guys ever get to do the, the 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 summer trips, the the out and about kind of, uh, you know, getting away from home? Yeah, my parents were really good about that kind of stuff. We every summer we went and rented a cabin in like New Hampshire or Vermont or Maine, and uh, they also had a trailer. We would go, you know trailing pulling the trailer down to florida and on the weekends we were always going someplace my mom was always uh setting up little trips and stuff so yeah we got out a lot so i was lucky about that i had a, I had a really good childhood with with all of that nice nice yeah. so okay so we get we get further through your uh oh i know um did you ever <laughs> i remember that i remember this from uh from growing up uh um, did you have to take one of those, 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 those crazy tests that the, uh, that the, um, what is it? The, the school counselors always make you take that tell you, oh, you would be a good burger flipper or you would do this, uh, that type of thing. Did you ever have to take those? Yeah. I mean, he called me into, the, you had to go through like, there was like 750 kids in, in my graduating class. So he had to try to get through everybody. So he didn't have a lot of time. Sure. So he calls me in and he shows me the test and I got all these, you know, the great scores across the top and all that. And he said, uh, well, you could you could do anything you want to do. He says, what do you what do you want to do? Are you going to go to college? And I said, no, I don't want to go to college. I just really I just want to go travel around and kind of figure out what I want to do. And, you know, and and that's what I started doing. Really, I started hitchhiking around. I hitchhiked all the way down to Florida, up to Quebec and you know, into Canada and wow. different colleges that my friends were at. And yeah, so I was. My intention was just uh, not to get locked down on anything and just uh, to travel and find out what the heck's going on. I mean, you grow up in this little bubble and you know there's a big world out there. And I was looking for some kind of adventure. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first say, uh, do not hitchhike. Uh, this was a much different time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so do yeah, it was that, legal. Uh, it was legal back then. And the truth is I never had problems with anybody. And I almost never had a hitchhike more than five minutes. I mean, back in those days, people would hitchhike to college. It would hitchhike home from, uh, from, uh, the army, things like that. Yeah. I really literally almost never hitchhiked, had a hitchhike more than five minutes. Even if I was traveling from all the way to Florida, back up to New York, I, I would make it in two rides and it, it would be like faster than I could drive myself. Wow. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So in that, that's, uh, you said you didn't, never had any issues with, uh, with, which hit with hitchhiking, um, ever any cool experiences? Like you, 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 you knew you wanted to go somewhere, you went there and, and it was just completely unexpected, just a complete, uh, wow, this is crazy. You know, I when I would hitchhike, I get out on that highway and I would just feel so free. It's hard to explain. Like, I just felt like I was free. You know, it was, wasn't costing me much. I would go on long trips with like, I would take a sleeping bag, put a, a, a loaf of bread, some peanut butter, some honey in the, in the, in the bag, 20 bucks. And I would go off for two weeks and come back with change. You know, it was, I just felt the freedom. I remember I was hitchhiking to a, a girlfriend's place that she was going to college in Connecticut. 
I got out on a, the uh, the freeway next to my house. I got three rides in a row, all bang, bang, bang from Mercedes. And they dropped me off at the door to her, her uh, dorm. You know, so it was kind of like, that was pretty amazing. Uh, another mm -hmm. time, a friend of mine had to go back to the, the Air Force base down in Pensacola, Florida. And he asked me if I would mind doing a trip down with him from New York, and then I could hitchhike back. And I said, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll do that. So we went down there, and uh, I got out on the road the next morning to hitchhike. And I, I decided to go see a friend that had moved down there to uh, Orlando recently. And uh, so I thought I didn't have the guy's phone number because I didn't have a, a phone at my apartment at that time, and he didn't have one in his, and it was before cell phones and all that. Mm -hmm. So, But I had his address, and I figured, oh, I don't know how big Orlando is, but I had the concept that I could get there and ask around and somehow find his address. So I get out on the, on the road in the morning, and I'm sitting on the, the wood railing, and somebody had carved into it that they had hitchhiked there for 12 hours and didn't get a ride. And I'm thinking, I'm sure having his knife out didn't particularly help him, but he probably must have been really ugly or something. I don't, how do you hitchhike for 12 hours and not get a ride? But anyway, I got a ride right away. The guy took me across the top of Florida, and uh, and then when he was going to let me out, he gets on the CB on his little radio, and he said, yes, is anybody heading down to Orlando? You know, I got a guy here could use a ride. So somebody responds there a mile back. And, you know, so he pulls over, I get into the car. It's uh, two business guys in a big Cadillac. Other than saying hello, we didn't say anything. They were talking business in the front seat. And I'm just quietly sitting in the back. At some point, he says, Okay, this is basically Orlando. Uh, we're heading down to Miami. So, you know, so I jump out of the car. And I think, all right, I'll go get something to drink. And then I'll figure out how to find my friend. And I see like a little 7-Eleven or something a few hundred yards away. So I walk over to that. And as I walk in the door, there's my friend Billy at the counter buying a drink. <laughs> you know, so those are the kind of things were happening. I was just like, I didn't know why. I, I still don't know why. But there was a lot of stuff like that happening to me. And I just felt I was always the luckiest guy in the world. That's that's how I've always, you know, looked at it. And my mom would say, yeah, you know, God takes care of uh, the drunks and the, and, the, uh, and the fools, you know. So I thought, okay, good. I can probably qualify both ways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. Uh, <laughs> I'm a drunk and a fool. I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's uh, oh, wow. Yeah. And that's, you're right. You, you know, you, you don't hear those stories these days. It's, it's uh, uh, obviously, I mean, you know, yeah, hitchhiking, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you definitely had some, some, uh, I don't know, some sort of intervention, whether it be divine intervention or what, some, yeah. something there. Um, so I'm so as I'm tracking the story, mom was reading Jack London books, books about exploring the world that yep. ta that takes hold inside of you. You are explore. You start to explore the world, even, you know, even at the at, the, at a younger age now. As we're doing this, I guess the, the question is to, to get the full time from you. We did the high school. We, we went through high school. Is this still during, I mean, friend in the military? So we're, what was the, what was the, how old were you at this point? At which point? Where, where well, like, well, I guess by the, by the tail end. By like it's where you're like high school. Your, okay. Like high is, school, right? At, the year after high school, right in that kind of zone right there. Okay. Where I was doing a lot of the hitchhiking, yeah. Okay. So, you, okay. So you graduate from high school. You're, you're in doing a bunch of that hitch, the, the hitchhiking thing. Um, yeah, I had a clam boat. So, oh, know, whoa, could, whoa, could, <laughs> stop there. What you, uh, you had a clam boat at uh, right out of high school before I even got out of high school? Uh, okay, while I was in high school, when I had time, like on, in the summertime and things like that, I had a job working at a boat station and I would work from six in the morning to six at night. And I would, uh, part of the boat station was pumping gas for the boats that would come in. So, there were clam diggers that would come in to get uh, gasoline. And I would ask them, I said, well, how much did you make today? And they would say, I made $80 or I made $120. And I'm like, holy shit. You know, it, like minimum wage was less than $2. Right. And these guys were coming in with all kinds of money. So I thought, all right, I'm going to save my money and buy a clam boat. So I did. I saved my money. I got a clam boat. And, uh, you know, I could, I was making more money in a day than my friends could make at a regular job in a week. But the funny thing is, from my mom's viewpoint, she thought like I was like some kind of bum because I wasn't working every day. I you know, if I would have worked nine to five, you know, at the gas station or 7-Eleven, she would have thought, you know, I was just a hardworking kid. But because I had all this extra money and all this extra time, she was like, 
this kid's a bum, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it was just ironic. <clears throat> wow. So, okay. So I want some clam boat stories. Tell us about, uh, Oh, clam boat. I'll tell you a clam boat story. Yeah. I mean, my friends who are also clam diggers, you know, a lot of times we'd go out to like one of the islands out in the middle of the bay, like nobody around. It's a small island. And uh, we would, you know, make a campfire and bring some food and get drunk out there and tell bullshit stories. And, uh, you know, we get into discussions like, could that, you know, my friend beat me in a, a fight if he kicked me between the legs, but I, you know, use my wrestling or something like that. You know, we, we just dumb crap that you would do at, you know, teenagers. So we were having this, you know, fight and he wound up, I, I threw him on the ground and I pinned him. He got pissed and he bit me in the neck, right? So I go home. I'm always trying to cover up whatever marks on my face from fighting and bull crap like that. And I'm sitting at the dinner table because I don't want my mom to bring this, bring questions up about this and stuff. And she's like, she sees this big purple bite mark on my neck, right? And she says, oh, my God. She goes, where do you go to meet women? The Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fine. So... <laughs> It just deserves a good laugh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was, there was, so you can do illegal clamming, which means that you go into uh, the clam beds. And if you do illegal clamming and you go into the clam beds, the clams are so thick that, you know, you have these you either use tongs, like a, a big, uh, like a whole post hole digger with like 14, 15, 16 foot wood poles that are tied to these big metal uh, cages with, with like metal fingers on them. And you, you dig into the ground and you, you shake it and the sand and the mud comes out and then you have the clams. Or you can get a rake, which is like this big curved uh, rake thing with teeth on it. And you kind of drag that with a long pole, usually about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet long. And you drag that through the sand and mud and you get the clams. Well, if you go into the, to, uh, the clam bed itself, like the illegal area where they have it all seated and bedded, you can't hardly get your tongue or rakes into the ground. I mean, it's that, it's like a brick wall of perfect clams. Okay. And uh, the summer of the Olympics, uh, 19, what was it, 76, up in Montreal, I was hanging out with my friend and two girls, and we were talking, what are we going to do for the summer, you know, do something exciting. And the idea came, well, we'll hitchhike the four of us up to Montreal and see the Olympics. But they didn't have any money. I had I had money. So I, they're like, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So I'd say, okay, listen, let's go out and we'll go do illegal clamming for a couple hours. And it'll make enough money for all of us to take a vacation for, for the summer, right? So the idea was that the four of us were on the boat and it's at night, which is extra worse because you're not supposed to clam at night. If we get caught, I'm going to lose my boat, my gear, and I'm going to get a big, big penalty for it, right? Like a major penalty for it. Right. But anyway, I'm, I'm, we're going to do this. And uh, so first, myself and another person, we get dropped into the water. They go off on the boat. We fill up a, a big sack of uh, clams. They come back. We get back up on the boat. We drop them off. And then the conservation boat comes up on us. And we don't have any clamming equipment on the boat because the only equipment we have is in the water with the other two people. And so they see the clams are wet. They see we're wet. <laughs> they, they know somebody's <laughs> pulling clams out of the place, right? <clears throat> Close to the shore where it's where the, the spot was. Anyway, when they went in, it was a guy and a girl. My friends were in the water together. When they saw the conservation boat, they just started kissing, had dropped everything. <laughs> And uh, so that they couldn't find any of the equipment there. We came back the next day. We picked up their clams, that rake, and we, you know, we sold it. So we didn't get caught. There was no way they could actually, you know, uh, say that they knew I was clamming because they didn't see me clamming. I had no clamming gear. But it, uh, we sold that and it paid for our trip. And the four of us hitchhiked up to uh, Montreal and saw the Olympics. So yeah, it was it was a great trip. Wow, <laughs> that was another clamming story. <laughs> That's a great clamming story. Um, so, uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, I, so what it sounds like to me is it sounds like basic teenage uh, hijinks <laughs> for lack of mm -hmm. a better term, 
but I never clammed <laughs> during my high school years. So apparently it's uh, uh, not something you get to do in the Midwest. So uh, I'll, I'll take it. But uh, no, it's uh, wow. That's uh that's fun. And I'm seeing a lot in the, in the chat, people going, Hey, we, we did that. Uh, you know, I, I did clay. I, yeah. M muscle building all this. So, um, so it's apparently, it's just a, it, it's just something Long that... Island. A lot of people, a lot of people do clamming on Long Island. And it was, it was at one point, there okay. was thousands of clam boats off Long Island. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So, so you have the clam boat. You, you obviously don't have a clam boat now. Um, <laughs> um, how did that, how did that, well, actually, let, before we, before we go there, um, now you were doing all this in high school. So you were, you were, you were, uh, you were living at home the entire time or, or did you end up uh, moving? I out left, at some point? I, uh, I left home. I mean, I left shortly right at the end of high school, just for maybe a month or so. And I was living at a friend's house and then I came back. I lived at my house with the parents for about a year. And then myself and my friend got an apartment. Uh, the way we, we did that, back in those days, if you wanted to get an apartment, you went to uh, a little middleman place that would, you know, you would tell them it was a business. And you would say, hey, I'm looking to rent an apartment. They'd say, okay, what area, what price range? So hmm. we said, uh, sure. you know, we said about within like 10 miles of my parents' house and the cheapest possible. So they were like, okay, cheap as possible. You can imagine the you can imagine the block they gave me. You know, I was we rented uh uh <laughs> the second story of this house, and it was right next to uh a funeral home on one side, and like two houses down was a house of prostitution. <laughs> and everybody on the street except myself and my friend, they did something for money that was not legal. They either sold guns, drugs, the bodies, something. It was, it was, uh, the place was, was pretty hardcore street. I tell you, the guy downstairs, <laughs> he was, if somebody drove down the street, he was moving the curtain to see if it was the police or whatever, because he was wanted by the police. And, uh, if he needed milk or a newspaper or something, I would get it for him down the street because he wouldn't leave the house. He didn't want to get picked up. So that was the, the kind of scene it was, you know. So, but it, it worked, you know. Absolutely. So, and and how long did you how long did i i guess i'm 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 for, well, inadvertently foreshadowing how long were you in that place i was in there for at least a year i mean after a, a few months uh my friend he went back to college he decided he was going to return to college and he became like a professor at college and you know oh, wow. he, he did really well in life but i was there now i had to, to pay the whole rent myself you know so i'm working my little butt off and uh i'm paying the rent and just you know bare necessities after that so that's kind of what was leading up to when i wound up joining the sea oak um yeah i was living in that apartment working and wasn't really going getting ahead and you know that whole thing and it was winter time there was all kinds of snow outside yeah, yeah. and there was you know the sea oak out in california in the sunny palm trees so that's kind of how it led up to that before and, and before we go to that to, to that point, so you're you're living in this. So your 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 roommate leaves. You're paying for the whole thing yourself. Is this all clam boat money? Is this is that is that no? All you at do? that time, I was just doing odd and end jobs. I would I would work for a few weeks, make money, and then go hitchhike someplace. I'd go hitchhike to somebody. Oh, okay. College and go visit them and stuff. So I was always just like kind of popping in and popping out. If I had enough money to go travel, I was gone. I was traveling. Then I'd come back. I'd go pick up some work. You know. It was kind of like that kind of situation. Sure. It was funny. The first night I was in that apartment, uh, I was upstairs, and I get woken up. There's a police officer standing over me. To give you an idea of the street, right? I mean, the guy doesn't knock on the door. He's like not taking any chances. He comes straight into the apartment. He's standing over the, my my bed. And I'm like, what's happening, right? And he said, well, uh, a girl on the street got raped last night, and, um, you know, I'm trying to find them. And the neighbor said that you were new to the area and that you look like you might fit the description. He goes, but I know it wasn't you. And I said, well, how do you know it wasn't me? He said, because her mother got a hold of him with a baseball bat and you're not marked up. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> hello, hello, new neighborhood. You know, so I never left uh, that door unlocked again. I can tell you that. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> this is a uh, wow. Uh, it was a, it was a badass street. I'm telling you. <laughs> 
That, wow. The yeah, and the police just standing right above you there. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that's a neighborhood. That is a that is a neighborhood. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> So how did, um, how did you start to, so I, I'm, I'm kind of reading the cues here, right? I'm seeing, I'm seeing things as, as you've been telling them. And, um, I, I sorry, I didn't mean to blank out there. Um, how did you lead, uh, what led so that sounded led like it was sounding like it started leading you into Scientology. How did how did before before Sea Org and maybe I'm jumping ahead or maybe I'm I'm missing a, a cue here. Um, yeah, what interested you? How how did you find out about Scientology in the first place? All right, all right, check this out. Back in those days, I mean, I don't think most people even ever heard of the word Scientology. You know, uh, I right. hadn't I had never heard of Scientology. I never heard of Dianetics or any of that stuff. But uh. In 1976, on the bicentennial 4th of July, I sent myself and a bunch of friends headed out to the end of Long Island to do a little camping and see a big fireworks display that was going to be there. So uh, we were, you know, just drinking beer and we were smoking a little pot of weed, whatever they call it these days, and um, throwing a football around and just kind of relaxing. And one of my friends, Jack, uh, he, he comes over and he says, hey, I, bought, I just bought these little pieces of paper from somebody that has, you know, some kind of drug on them or whatever, right? And he, he starts asking my friends, anybody want one? And everybody's going, no, no, none of my friends did any kind of drugs like that. And, uh, but I said, okay, you know, I, I said, give me one of those. I'll try it, right? So I took one. He, he took one. After about 20 minutes, I didn't feel anything. He didn't feel anything. So then I started teasing him. I said, Jack, you know, you just paid this guy for freaking paper, right? <laughs> so then we we he had some more we ate some more of it and we didn't think anything of it we didn't feel anything um we went down to watch the fireworks <clears throat> and it was uh the beach was so crowded that you could hardly walk through it there was people with blankets and chairs and you know, sitting all over the place and we were sitting there we're looking up in the sky and we're watching the firework display and after you know 45 minutes or something like that the the display is coming to an end and i look around and there's nobody sitting within a circle of like 50 feet from us, like just this big open circle made in the middle of all these people that nobody is in. And I'm like, what the heck, right? It, it, it didn't make any sense, right? but, you know, we just kind of commented on, on it to each other. And uh, we got up to go walk towards the main town off the beach. And as I was walking, I felt like... Uh, like I was observing everything. Like I was totally, totally there. And everything was like very, I was very aware of everything. And I was very aware of everybody. I kind of felt like uh, I had landed on the planet for the first time because I didn't have any preconceived ideas about anything. It was, it was really strange. And uh, so I walk up to the main the middle of the town and I'm standing on the corner. I just look normal. I'm not anything weird. Nobody will walk past me. They'll change direction. They'll cross the street. I'm not saying anything. I'm not doing anything. I'm just standing there. And these people can't be in my space. And I'm like, what is going on? And I said to my friend, Jack, I said, Jack, I feel like I'm as big as a mountain. Like I really, I've just felt huge. And I said, uh, and I feel like I was thinking, I feel like if I wanted to go do something, see somebody that was like a hundred miles away, I would just go there just without any, you know, restrictions on it. I said, and then I thought to myself, well, I have, there was one, be one restriction. I'd, I'd have to think of, uh, you know, sheltering and feeding my body and stuff. And that was the first time I had ever thought of myself as being other than my body like that. It was, it was uh, unique. So I'm like, whoa, what's happening here, right? <laughs> so uh, we decided we're going to go back to the campground. So I put my thumb out to hitchhike, and this guy about our age starts pulling over. And as he starts pulling over, I could feel him freaking out because I was like able to like perceive him so strongly kind of that he couldn't, he couldn't have, he started freaking out. I said, uh, uh, I got I got to turn around. I got to go back. And he, he swung the car around. So me and Jack looked at each other and we're like, wow, what the heck is going on? Right. 
So then we started walking towards the campground, which was still like four miles away or something. And mm -hmm. uh, I just, there was a car coming behind us. And I just, it was like one of these country roads next to, parallel to the beach. And I put my, my thumb out and this car pulls over. It's got three girls in it. And I'm trying to, she, she pulls over and I'm trying to approach the car is like, yeah, as easy as possible. And trying to get into the space and open that car. We get in the car and this girl starts, she puts the pedal to the mouth. She starts driving like a maniac down this road. And I'm like, I, I like she pulled the car over so we can get out. Cause she, I understood what was going on. She was trying to get out of the space by driving out of the space. You understand? She could not be in our space. She could not have herself perceive that strongly. You know, that's the only way I could describe it. So we get out of the car. We walk back to the campground. We lay down on a, a sand dune, just fell asleep right away. And I'm thinking, am I going to feel like this in the morning or is things going to go back to normal? And yeah, they went back to normal. So then about a week later, I'm thinking, you know, what the hell was that? I would like to just experience that one more time and see if I could like check that out and understand it a little more. So I went over to Jack's house and Jack, we, I knew him since we were little tiny kids. He's very athletic, very smart, uh, very happy kind of guy. I knock on his door and he's crying, but he's, he's not just crying. He's like, he's like crying. So he can't breathe crying. And I said, Jack, what's happening? And he's trying to get it. He can't, he can't say it. Right. And then finally he gets it together enough to say everything. And I'm like, holy shit. And I found out what happened was he had gone into New York city by himself, taken that drug, went around perceiving the whole thing and looking at it like for the first time. And it completely overwhelmed him. And he didn't want to be part of life. He didn't, he didn't want to work. He didn't want, he didn't want to play. He didn't want, nothing and i was like oh i i could i could duplicate like understand what he had experienced and what he was feeling and why but there was no way i was going to go into agreement with that <clears throat> there was also no way i was going to do that drug again <laughs> but uh, we're right um but yeah that's what was happening so then i was went went off and you know i was doing other things and i didn't know how, what i could do to help jack I, didn't, I really didn't have a solution there answer for him and uh, one day I'm up in my apartment. I got a bunch of the guys over drinking beer, playing poker, that kind of thing. And and uh, knock, knock on the door. It's Jack. And his hair is all trimmed nice. And he's got nice clothes on. And he's got a decent car out front. And he's on his way to work. And I'm like, and he looks good. And I'm like, holy smokes. I mean, what happened? I think maybe he found Jesus or something, which is fantastic. Whatever has helped this kid is is great, you know? So I said, what's going, what have you been doing, Jack? And he said, Scientology. And I said, I never heard of it. And he said, well, here's a book. It's called Dianetics. Give me two bucks. I'll give you the book and I'll stop by sometime. So I threw him the two bucks, he threw me the book. I tried to read this thing. You know, if anybody ever tried to read Dianetics, don't waste your time. It's like a thousand pages of mookity mock mook. You know, <laughs> it goes around in circle. But I kind of got the concept of it. And the concept of it seemed, you know, all right, you know, there's maybe something to the kind of basic concept of it. But the book itself is just like, <laughs> throw it away. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, now that I know, I tell you, I could train someone to, to give a Dianetic session to someone in like two hours if they knew nothing about the subject. It's it, There's only a few questions that you run kind of repetitively around in a circle. It hmm. doesn't have to be all complex like that stupid book. But anyway, <laughs> um, so he said, uh, basically what had happened was he had gone to the beach. He was crying, sitting there crying. Some lady came up who was a Scientologist and talked to him and basically gave him some hope, some hope that something was worth living for. And that's that's really what propped him up. And so he went gone down to this uh, Scientology mission, which was just literally the next block over from where I was. And it was this little tiny house. And he wanted me to go down there and, and uh, check the place out. I was like, no, nah, it's cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm, that's for people. You, that's a health place. I don't need help. You know, that was my view. But I don't need help. You know, but that's if it's helping you, that's real good. So after a few weeks of been persisting, I said, okay, all right, I'll go down there and just check it out. So I went in there and I took that 200 question personality test that you do, and uh, the head guy, he was, you know, supposed to be some big wig or something, and and but he gave me the creeps to tell you. He, he just gave me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted, you know, after I did the fill out the test, I'm supposed to go with him upstairs to get the results. 
and I have to walk through this room because I was in a lo little lobby thing at the house and I'm walking through a room and there's somebody in there with a, a meter with cans tied to it and there's two other people staring at each other and I'm like, this place is freaking weird, right? And I'm thinking, if this guy does <clears throat> the slightest thing, when I go upstairs, I'm going to just knock, his, knock him on his butt and get the freak out of here. So we sit down and this guy says, you know, shows me, I think there's 10 different traits and he says, yeah. You know, your traits look, you're doing good. The test looks good, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to do a basic communications course? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do anything. I said, I really, I said, I'm not really interested in Scientology. I said, I just came here to appease my friend, Jack. And, uh, you know, otherwise I'm out of here. And I was, I was out of here. Being this guy didn't hit it off at all. But then I was willing to, uh, in the follow-up weeks, to, to look at some of their books. And I would read them at my own apartment. And then some of the stuff was kind of interesting. And uh, it had to do, you know, that you're different than your your body is different from you, this kind of stuff, which, you know, is a concept that religions have had forever. But it was, you know, but I was like, okay. So it seemed like there could be something interesting here. So I went down and I did the uh, communications course with 50 bucks. And so I'm going to do the communications course. It's two and a half hours in the evenings. And uh, they had a 15 minute break in between. So on a 15 minute break, I'm running next door to the bar where my friends were. I'm having a beer and watching, getting the update on the football scores. And then I run back and get back on course. Well, it took them a little while to figure out that what I was doing. And then they just got to freaking out. Like you can't, you can't be drinking while you're on study, blah, blah, blah. They said, you got to go uh, for a week, take no drugs. The only drugs I did was I drank and I did uh, pot, occasional joint or whatever. And, uh, I didn't I didn't I didn't consider that alcohol was a drug. I didn't think they were talking about alcohol when they said don't go don't do any drugs for a week and come back. So I come back and I said okay, I want the week and they go without drinking. I said oh, I didn't know you were drinking, you know. They said no, no drugs, no drinking, no pot, no nothing. You nothing for 2 weeks and come back. So then I did that. I didn't didn't do any drugs, no drinking, nothing. I came back after 2 weeks and then it was a Sea Org member that was on a recruit tour that happened to stop in. And she was a beautiful girl with red hair and she was supposed to be clear. She had the clear bracelet on and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, that's kind of how, you know, and she had a slideshow and the slideshow was people doing construction renovations back in Los Angeles and, you know, the sunny uh, Los Angeles and stuff. So here I was in frozen uh, Long Island you know, work my butt off just to pay the rent and, and eat and that kind of stuff. And uh, so I was kind of like drawing that direction a bit there. And then I just I just say it in Scientology, everything has a price to it. And the, the, mm -hmm. the basic stuff was like 50 bucks for a course, a little introductory course. But if you really want to, they had this chart up that would be like, you know, it would be work your way up all these steps. You could become uh, OT and these OTs are supposed to be able to go exterior uh, from their bodies with full perception. They're supposed to be able to be cause of matter, energy, space, and time. I mean, you know, super power kind of stuff, you know, that these guys were promising and, and like who wouldn't be interested in that if you thought it could happen, you know? Sure. And, but it was very expensive. You'd have to have a, as much money as a nice house to, to actually go up those levels. And what I found out was that if you join the Sea Org, you got your, you're supposed to get your ordering and your, all that kind of stuff in your room and your board and all that is supposed to be uh, given to you in exchange for you working on doing renovation and construction. And I was interested in learning renovation and construction. And I was interested in being part of a group that was supposed to be, you know, a group of OTs and all these, you know, sound like some kind of like pretty badass group, you know? So I was like, okay, you know, I, I said, where is this girl that, that's got the, uh, cause I had gone in the next day to have my little appointment this meet her, right? Just thinking I couldn't join it, but I knew I didn't qualify, but I was going to go check this girl out. Cause I was kind of curious to talk to somebody who was supposed to be clear with this perfect mind and all this stuff. You were interested but in I the hot it. redhead. Yeah, I was interested in that too, but she was married, <laughs> but she was, she was okay. more interested in me. Okay. Uh, that's, but what happened was I go into the lobby and there's a guy that was new and he's signing something. I said, what do you sign? He said, I'm signing the CEO contract. I said, how can you be signing the CEO contract? And he said, I said, you're new like me. And he said, yeah, anybody can join the CEO. So I said, oh, if anybody can join it, I'm going to join it. Where's that girl? And he goes, she's upstairs. I go upstairs and I say, hey, I want to join the CEO. And she thought I was kidding, you know? And I said, no, I really, I want to join the CEO. So she said, well, 
if you if you're for real she goes come back with a, a plane ticket and i said all right so a couple hours later i came back with a plane ticket to los <laughs> angeles and she said well what would you need to go you know what do you what do you need to do and i said well i need to i just bought a used car yesterday i need to sell that i need to bring you know my keys back to the job and and quit that and i need to uh, I'll, I'll leave the apartment and leave the two hundred dollars down payment and all that stuff but i need to at least clean it out and stuff like that i need to say goodbye to a couple of people and Otherwise, I'm on the plane tomorrow evening. And she called Los Angeles and said, hey, you need to pick this guy up tomorrow evening. So I did all that. I stopped at my parents' house before leaving. They had been away camping. I stopped at the house, and I was really on the way to the airport. And I kind of just, we just caught each other at the last minute. Mm -hmm. And they saw me with the bag, and they were like, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to. I'm going to California to, to, be, uh, to work with Scientology. And they had never heard of Scientology either, but they... Right away, it's like the Moonies or some kind of crazy mm. cult thing. And, you know, I'm going off. And they were really upset, really upset. And uh, but I said, hey, you know, I'll I'll call you from there. I'll send you pictures and keep you, you know, up to date on what's going on. Mm. So I caught the plane to Los Angeles. I get there just just this part of the story because it's kind of funny. Sure. I get to Los Angeles. It's at night, middle of the night. And I'm like, okay, where's this guy that's supposed to pick me up? You know, somebody's supposed to pick me up. I'm joining this group of OTs, or the super duper group. <laughs> and as I'm going, I'm in the phone booth and I'm going through the yellow pages, like 10 different Scientology places listed. I'm like, oh, goody, I'm going to have to call them all to figure out where the hell I'm supposed to go. This guy walks up. He looks like he's homeless. He's, his hair is ragged and kind of greasy and laying off the side. He just woke up, which I'm sure he did. And uh, he's got a brown jacket on, and it's got missing buttons, and he's got to pull the cross to, to keep it closed. And he asks, are you you Mark Pesh? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this guy's here to pick me up. And uh, we go to his car, and he's got the door tied off with a rope. I'm like, holy shit, right? So we drive to the complex, the Scientology Big Blue building, and it had uh, only been purchased, you know, a few months earlier or something. And they still had a, a big fence around it with barbed wire across the top. And at the gate was a, a like a rent-a-cop guy with a, a German shepherd. And I look at this place and it looks like an insane asylum. You know, it looks bad. And the gate, the dog, the guard, what what am I into, right? This guy with the, with the tied off door. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I go in there and they say, okay, you're going to get a temporary place to sleep tonight with the more veteran Sea Org members in their dorm. And then tomorrow you'll be moved in with the new guys, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. So I go up to the sixth floor of the main building. I walk in the room. There's like 10 guys sleeping in there. The bed they show me is like some rusted metal friggin' bed with a nasty mattress and sheet on it. And the place smells like a locker room. And I'm I'm upset at this point. I'm like, ready to, I'm ready to tear the place up. And I... I put that door, that window all the way up to the, the cold uh, LA air. And I got everybody's attention now. And I like, I said, this place stinks. Right. And nobody, nobody said a thing. And I went over to the bed and I'm thinking, should I leave tonight and hitchhike the West coast? Or should I wait till the morning to get the hell out of this place? Right. And I thought I'm going to get a couple hours sleep and then I'll leave. So I, I laid a blanket down where I laid on half of my blanket and I pulled the other half over me. So I didn't have to touch nothing. That's mm -hmm. how I felt about that frigging bed. And uh, in the morning, as the sun was starting to come up, I went down the fire escape on the opposite side of where that guard was. I threw my suitcase over. I used the wall to jump over that fence. And I headed down to this little diner called Norm's. I was going to get some breakfast. And I go in there. And uh, as I'm ordering breakfast, some guy comes in. And he's got the, the you know, fake military-looking uniform right. that uh, the recruiters would wear, right? I didn't know at the time the difference between all that kind of stuff. But that, he was he was a recruiter himself. He had the same uniform on as as Pat did, the, the redhead chick, who, by the way, wanted me to take her out partying that night to the bars and all that stuff when I'm supposed to leave the next day. <laughs> and I, she was persistent. And she was married. And I told her, you know, I didn't want to start off on the wrong foot in that place. I said, no, no. But um, anyways, so this guy, <laughs> he sits down. And I, I'm like, what is going on in this place? You know, and I, I start talking to him. And he realizes what's happening. And he says, OK, listen, listen. Let me take you back there show you some of the areas that we already fixed up and uh you know and show you where the guys are working and stuff so i said all right show me show me so we go back there we walk in there and he shows me where the guys are working and some guys are sitting on a paint bucket and they're rolling some cigarettes and i said oh you guys smoke pot here i said i got trouble for that back in new york 
<laughs> and they're like, no, 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 no. We know that she was we're rolling cigarettes. And I'm like, rolling cigarettes. The only time I ever seen anybody roll cigarettes was at a class trip to some insane asylum, you know. But anyway, that's what they were doing. They were rolling cigarettes and I kind of see what they're doing and I'm thinking, all right. So I kind of agree that uh, I'll give the place a chance. And that's kind of how my foot got in the door in that joint. And there it is. And there it is. Yeah. So, <laughs> so to recap, <laughs> you had an acid trip. <laughs> it wasn't even acid. I don't know what it was. I mean, we didn't hallucinate. Oh. It just, it just, uh, like I know it with acid. I didn't know that at the time, but since I, then I realized, you know, I've heard or learned or whatever that when somebody takes like, acid or LSD or something like that, that it actually makes them hallucinate. And they usually have trouble going to sleep for hours afterwards and all this kind of stuff. We, I had no, we had no hallucinations and we had no trouble falling asleep. So I don't know what the, I really don't know what they had put on that paper. So day, I don't know. So no hallucinations, but you had the, the kind of the, the personal space bubble people feeling the bubble didn't yeah, want we to had, get involved in. Yeah. yeah. It was some, some kind of, Wow. I don't know, like, like some kind of super awareness thing happened. Yeah, and then obviously your friend uh, kind of yeah. did it to the extreme by going to New York City and, and experiencing Yeah, it was one that. thing to be in a, in a happy environment with some people there and you could kind of feel them. Right. I mean, you could like almost perceive for real like how they emotionally were feeling kind of thing. Wow. It was that that tense. Sure. And uh, yeah, so when he went into the city by himself, he just he just got completely completely overwhelmed by it absolutely absolutely and then and then so you you went in so how long i guess maybe i missed how long from when you first walked into that uh, scientology mission uh to when you uh ran over to pat the redhead and said i, I want to <laughs> sign up for the sea org well how i how would say you... uh maybe four months Oh, okay. So you were, so you spent, so you spent some time in there. You, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like an immediate uh, change of mindset there. You, you obviously, no. got, okay, yeah. got into it. And, yeah. um, and that makes sense. It, it, it obviously seems like from, from your part of the experience that there was kind of that slow build in interest that, cause obviously when they said, you know, no, 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 no drugs, um, right you were you were in enough to be okay i'm i'm willing to do this i'm i'm willing to take it so you, there was obviously a um it wasn't yeah, i like, bought into it enough that i was willing to you, you know and i was getting ready to the, just start in the next little course they had you know so i was like i was getting get my feet more and more into the door and you know yeah it was kind of the thing i did on you know as a like a little side hobby you know i wasn't like super like into it at that point but i was experimenting on it sure. checking it out sure so and then this whole time <laughs> this whole time you are you are mr mark pesh and we didn't talk yeah. about this but somewhere in the the next part of your journey from once you've entered scientology to when you leave scientology the name that people know you by uh, changes. Yeah. You want to tell us that story quick? <laughs> okay. I'll tell you that quick. <laughs> um, basically to take it from where I was, the, the new guys were all working on the, on, uh, renovating one of the buildings. It was called the American St. Hill organization. And, okay. uh, and, uh, we're all working like we'd work for 20 hours and get three or four hours sleep kind of thing. And we weren't getting any study What new guys are supposed to get five hours study, but I didn't know any of that stuff to me. I didn't even know if there was any study going to be happening. I, didn't, I really was just going with the flow. I, I didn't know what was going on, but uh, whatever was being asked me, I was doing it, which was mainly just, you know, uh, mudding and sanding these walls and prepping them for preparing them for painting. And, and so I'm there standing in the hallway doing that for a few days. And I hear the two guys that are running the job were standing behind me one day. And they're talking about how are we going to get the all the floors, these old hospital floors stripped and waxed. And I turned around and I said, hey, I can do that. And they, and they were like kind of surprised. Well, how would you do that? And I told them what materials I would need. And, you know, I knew how to do it because I had done that before in, in a, for a hospital back in New York. Hmm. And they were like, okay, um, you're in charge of the floors. <laughs> so 
Sure. I worked my butt off. I got all those floors stripped and waxed. It's a four-story building and uh hospital old hospital building. And you know, about one hour before they were gonna move the whole place in, I finished up the last floor and you know, it was a success. So then I'm told, okay, you know, that was really good. We're gonna send you on a mission. Well, I don't know what a mission is. It's, you know, in Scientology, a mission is like a special project that you get what has spe specific uh, steps and uh, something that you're supposed to accomplish that's, you know, named and, you know, it's run by a person that's called the mission operator. Anyway, I don't know what a mission is. I'm thinking mission impossible. I'm thinking maybe they're having trouble with somebody and they want me to do something. I, you know, I was, my mind was like whew, into all kinds of things, right? So I said, yeah, go up to this room, blah, 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 in the, in the building. So I head over there and uh, the sign says, uh, uh, flag mission firing. And I walk in the girl that's in charge of the woman that's in charge of, uh, getting everybody ready to be fired on that mission. I said, what's flag. And she looks at me like, oh no, cause I don't know if, if I don't know what flag is, which is like the main thing in, in Scientology, the mm -hmm. main building there in, in Florida that, you know, they consider it their Mecca in Scientology. Right. If I don't know what that is. It would be like walking into a Catholic church and say, what's a Pope? You know, it's like she looks at me, knows I'm not a Scientologist, and she's like, uh. Uh, so she puts me full time with a, a supervisor to try to make a Scientologist out of me. I got to do some courses and they do one on one and I get through them fast and they send me on this mission. What I'm supposed to be is uh, a, a purchasing agent. I'm supposed to do all the prices, pricing and stuff for the next building, the, the project they're doing, which is the advanced organization in los angeles and i'm going to be the seventh on this mission i'm just supposed to be they give me a list of uh, construction materials i'm supposed to call and get three prices on each one and then write a, a whole uh submission on why i should buy that quantity of that paint you know based on the walls square footage and mm. it was it was really it was uh they gave me a desk with a type i never typed before <laughs> I really thought they had me confused with something. I walked in there and they tried to, they said, here's your desk, here's your phone. I'm like, you know, you're going to you're this purchasing agent. I'm like, uh, you got me confused. I said, like, I did purchasing. I drove a truck, you know, the, the pickup materials for a, a tile company, you know, I'm not a yeah. purchasing agent. But I said, no, no, we don't, it's no confusion, you know, here's your desk, blah, blah, blah. So we were getting, the schedule was 30 hours work, three hours sleep per day. And that three hours is broken down to one hour intervals on uh, a, a pillow that was in the middle of the office that we, we would all share. By the clock, you're down for your one hour. That hour's up. You're off that pillow, back on your job. The other person swings over and gets on that pillow. I mean, when you hit that pillow, you were sleeping, believe me. <clears throat> but it was ridiculous. The girl that was in charge, uh, she was about 30 years old, and she would fall asleep on her typewriter. And then when somebody called to want to speak to her, we'd have to get underneath our arms and start walking her body around. She would have the the the, uh, the keys of the typewriter imprinted in her face, literally, <laughs> literally. And you know, we try to get her awake enough, and then she eventually was like, she was done. The other girl that was supposed to be doing what job I did was supposed to be two of us. She said, "I'm going to the bathroom," and then we never saw her again. And I'm pretty soon I'm I'm the only one in the office. Everybody else is gone, man. Mm. <laughs> so I had to finish that mission up that you know at the office part of it from my by myself anyway i did I, I did pull it off uh then they wanted me to they were going to form this organization up that would do renovations for the rest of the building and stuff and instead of having missions they were going to actually make a actually posted organization they wanted me to be the person over the logistic treasury kind of function and i said hey listen guys Oh, the other part of it was before I had left Long Island, I just, I didn't care what the, the pay was, whatever. But I had asked Pat, I said, hey, what do they pay you guys anyway? And she said, oh, we used to get paid around 60 to 80 bucks a week, you know, which would have been, you know, your minimum wage kind of thing. Well, when I get there and I'm working my first week or so, I go, they they, uh, they have the Seerg member come in, all those new guys are there. And this guy sets this little table down in a box with all the envelopes of the pay envelopes and stuff. And he starts calling people's name and handing out these envelopes and they open it up and they're all coming out with two single dollar bills. They're getting paid two dollars. Mm. Pay was 16, but they were on half pay, which was eight. And then the new guys were like quarter pay or something. So we were, it was two bucks, right? So I'm like, what the, this chick lied to me about the pay. I didn't really care about the two bucks. I was, but I was upset that I was lied to. Right. Sure. So when I went up, 
I, after the guy handed out the money, he had never called my name, but I had worked a few days, right? So in the real world, if you work, you don't get paid. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I go up there and this guy, you know, we're all the new guys and he's like, thinks he's way above everybody. And uh, I walk up and I say, hey, you didn't call my name. He doesn't even have the respect to look up. You know, he's just like, goes, right a CSW, which means completed staff work. It's like some kind of special way you put a submission together. And I said, what's a CSW? And he said, look it up in volume zero, right? <laughs> he's being real, a real dick. <clears throat> and I was just about to knock his ass out of his chair. And I thought, I'm not going to get kicked out of here the first week for freaking $2. <laughs> I don't care if I ever get paid. I'm not even going to stand in line for $2. You got to be kidding me, right? So I just blew it off. But now that I had worked there and done well for a while, and they wanted me to do this actually post, they want to put me on a post. I said, listen, guys, you want me to do the post, you need to give me every Saturday off, no matter what, no, not statistics, not anything. I get every freaking Saturday off because I'm going to go out and get some work so I can make some extra money because I ain't staying here for $2 a week, right? Um, so they were like, no, nobody gets allowed to do that. But um, I said, well, it's real simple. I get that. Or I'm going to go out the door and start hitchhiking, right? <laughs> so they said, uh, they approved it. They said, yeah, you get every Saturday off, you know, because the CEO member is supposed to get every Saturday off, every other Saturday off if their statistics are up. But in actual fact, they almost never get a day off sure. these days. That's for sure. But um, anyway, so, yeah, they approved it. So I got a job selling snow cones down at uh, on the, the beach. And I got, I sold them for 50 cents. And I got 10 cents for every one I sold. And I was selling them around usually between 700 and 1,000 of them on a, on a given day. So I was making 70 to 100 bucks, which was mm -hmm. fine with me. And, yeah, so I had that job. And I was that was going along fine. And then uh, they wanted to know. I got called into this room. And they want to know, uh, do I want to go work with L. Ron Hubbard? And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm not even really a Scientologist. I mean, I really didn't I knew nothing really about Scientology, hardly at all. I was, you know, read some basic policies and you know, dinked around with a couple of books and stuff like that. But like, you want me to go work with Elron Hubbard? I said, I, I literally said, What do you what do you what does he need? Somebody to rake his leaves? I said, Why why are you guys coming to me? Right. And they said, No, no, we've got they're gonna be doing some work up there, construction work and stuff like that, and they're looking for a crew and I said, all right. You know, I thought it sounds like it's going to be a hot place, but, um, you know, I had already proven to myself I could do things I didn't think I could do. So I was like, all right, good. I'll, I'll just, I'll take the leap. I said, yeah, I'll go. So they were like, okay, you can't say anything to anybody. You can't look funky. You, you just write up what you do for your job, how you do your job, leave your keys in the top drawer and be on such and such a corner of Los Angeles at such and such a time tomorrow. Right. So I'm like, okay. So I do that. And uh, I go to the corner in Los Angeles. I'm there on time. Nobody comes to pick me up. I'm like, are you guys freaking kidding me again? You know, <laughs> you guys are such idiots. I'm here. You haven't picked me up. I've now turned everything over behind me, you know, and uh, I've disappeared from my, my job. So I sneak back in and I go see the person that had told me that I was supposed to go there. And, and I say, hey, it's nobody showed up. And he said, oh, I'm sorry about that. Go do the same thing tomorrow, but in the meantime, you got to go lose yourself somewhere because you know you can't you can't be telling anybody that you're going what they called it over the rainbow. We was, it was called like going to where Elron Hubbard is, but nobody knew if it was in in this country or whatever. Yeah. So I go to one of the local colleges. I literally I was reading the book and I slept on the little uh, you know the, the little chair, not the chair, but the little seat you have when you watch a football game or whatever up there. Mm -hmm. um, so I go to the, yeah, I go there the next day and so, yeah, a fan picks me up, blah, blah, blah. They're doing all kinds of changing vehicles and checking electronically to make sure there's no bugs. And they're going through this whole rigmarole. And I wind up uh, where Hubbard's base was at that time, which was in Palm Springs in California. <laughs> and right away, you need to get an also known as an AKA. You can't be using your name. You can't be saying any Scientology words outside. So that's when myself and my friend who uh, had worked with and he was roommate and, you know, we had joined about the same time, my friend, Marty Rothman, who was Mark Rothman by legal name and I'm Mark Pesh. And we were in together at the same time and they said, you guys need to come up with names. And um, Marty said, okay, I'll be Marty. And he changed it to Rothburn. 
you know, I had to make it similar to your name and all that. So I, I changed mine from Mark to Matt, and I just decided to make it with one T. And then uh, Pesh, I made it to Peach, which is just changed the S to an A. So I was <laughs> for my five years up, up lines, I was known as Matt Peach. And then when I left there and I went back to Los Angeles, I had people saying, hey, whatever happened to your brother Mark? <laughs> 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 and I was got caught in the middle with two different friggin' names. <clears throat> so it was weird. Anyway, so I decided just to keep the last name as Pesh and keep the first name as Matt. And that's kind of how that whole thing went down. There it is. There it is. A legend is born. Well, legend was born before <laughs> that, but gotcha. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. That, uh, that you know, I think some people probably knew part of that story, but uh, that clears that clears that up as well. So uh, let's take a quick pause here for a second. I just want to remind everybody uh, uh, this uh, this program is being broadcast on both uh, uh, Queen Bee SP on Amy and Matt's channel, uh, and it's also being uh, broadcast on uh, my channel uh, at Denver Stevo. Uh, if you've subscribed to one, uh, please swing on over and subscribe to the other. If you've liked the sh uh, the program thus far on one, swing on over and like on the other as well. Um, we just want to make sure that uh, well, if you don't know the story, it's 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 a nice warm feeling to get a like for sure. But uh, more specifically than that, YouTube likes those likes, and every time a, a like is clicked, it gets the algorithm whatever that means, it gets the algorithm moving and thinking. And then those who watch programs similar to ours are introduced uh, in their suggested uh, viewings to shows like ours. So uh, it gets the word out there. It gets more people seeing the, uh, the programs uh, or at least seeing that the programs exist and then hopefully more click on those programs as well. So swing on over to both of our channels, uh, like subscribe and, uh, and uh, get that word out. So um, I'm going to hit a couple of uh, a couple of our starred questions, and then we're going to we're going to sure. talk for a few. Then let's talk for a few minutes about uh, about kind of uh, the post uh, Scientology end of this as well. So sure. um, whatever they want to know, whatever yeah. they have a question, I'll answer it. Absolutely. So here's a here's a Veronica Bombria, uh, Matt, 51 year old Long Island Long Islander here. Did you ever get into the Long Island music scene, uh, Good Rats, Zebra, Twisted Sister, etc.? Nope, I never did. You know, uh, I was kind of, I was kind of unusual in that I didn't follow any professional sports. I didn't follow. I didn't never bought music, never played music. Uh, you know, I I just didn't follow. I never didn't follow music really i just when i went to the clubs and stuff it wasn't there to, for the music usually it was just the, the drink and have a party you know absolutely absolutely uh deviant outcast what the heck kind of drug was that <laughs> i don't know it sounds like i a really don't yeah, it sounds like a hallucinogen of some sort but it doesn't uh, match any i've um heard about uh-huh gotcha same here I, I really i really <laughs> don't know uh, so yeah, no, we, uh, um, but if you ever find it, <laughs> if I ever find that I'll bury it because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... you know, I really, I think it hurt some other people too, because mm -hmm. I know some other people had committed suicide in the neighborhood around that time, kids, oh, and I okay. thought to myself, I didn't think of it till later, but I thought, you know what, they may have gotten hold of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Got, got you there. Got you there. Uh, Love it says, sounds like a low level mushroom or peyote. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I never did either one of those. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, let's see. <laughs> True story. Uh, all of the Sea Org dudes seem to have the name Mark. Yeah. Do they just recruit Marks? I don't know. It is strange. It is strange. I mean, mm -hmm. there is so many marks that it's it's ridiculous, actually. Right. Uh, yeah, very funny. Um, and then uh, Tim Greengrass says, uh, SIGs cost a lot now. Uh, how, how do they manage it? Oh, that's a good question. How do they manage it, the smoking? Uh, I knew a... 
Egyptologist that claimed uh, that there was an ex-corporate executive, that he was an ex-corporate executive, uh, but ate at Soup Kitchen uh, and notified the, uh, and, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a blur here, and rolled the cheapest tobacco available, solid Lucy's too. Uh, so I guess the question is, yeah, how do they manage, uh, how do they manage buying cigarettes today when, you know, packs are god awful expensive, and yeah, in the in the old days, I mean, just they were to... expensive then too. But were to they? tell you the okay. truth, most of the Sioux members back then were were rolling their own cigarettes, and then the the RPFers, the guys that were like below staff, they were in the rehabilitation project force, which is basically the uh, uh, almost like a prison camp for the Sioux. Those guys, they would pick up the, the the cigarettes from ashtrays from the parking lots and they would carry plastic bags and they would stick them those cigarettes partly smoked cigarettes into their plastic bag and they were called refries <laughs> and these guys were smoking that stuff back mm. then yeah mm -hmm. nasty i uh, i remember as a 20 year old just smoking and not rolling but but smoking um yeah, I would always save when I couldn't finish a cigarette. I would always save that half just because it's a good point. They were expensive then. They just happen to be a lot more now with all the taxes. But um, it's been a while. So, ah, Matt T Matt M with one T says Matt with one T. Smart guy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need that. I, the way I looked at it was the other T isn't doing anything, so you can just skip that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Uh, and then uh, I love this one. Got to post this one from uh, from Katura. Uh, no, no. Oh, this this one was a good one, and then there's another good one. Uh, did you, Matt, were you getting any auditing at this point? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Wow. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't get any auditing for eight years maybe except for getting a little uh inter interrogation before i went up to the international base but otherwise no i didn't get any ordering i mean I, I was so happy to go to the rpf when i got sent to the rpf because now i was going to get a chance to get some ordering and learn how to audit you know see if this stuff works otherwise right. no nah, you just working 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 okay Oof. um miranda could literally listen to you tell stories all day <laughs> oh, thank you. You're gonna love my book because I'm just like, I'm just got bit and piece in this thing. But when I, when you read the whole damn thing together, it's it's pretty pretty intense. I think Miranda would be excited for an audio version of the book. Will yep. you be recording yep. your own? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, awesome, um, awesome. And then, oops, before I knock myself out, thanks to this trackball. Uh, <laughs> Amy says, I never know what to call him because my family knows him as Matt and his family knows him as Mark. I usually say this guy. <laughs> yeah. And I get confused sometimes. Like what, what people am I with right now? Am I supposed to use my legal name? Should I use the name Amy calls me? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's a little confusing actually. Did you ever get the, somebody says one of the names and you go, Oh, are they talking yeah. to me? <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> love it love it thanks for that amy uh okay so at this point uh oops let me uh, hide that off the screen there so at this point fast forward to the tail end of your scientology career what got you what got you into the point where you said you know what enough's a damn enough why am i doing this what the F am I doing here? You know, I don't think most people just turn on a dime. Like they just wake up one day and like, what, you know, it, it's, sure. it's a process. It's a process, you know, different things happen and it kind of builds up. And, you know, most people try to route out at least once or twice before they ever get out of there. You know, uh, I did. And it's just, it's common. And there's all kinds of obstacles put in the way for you to get out. You know, you say you want to go and they say, OK, and they send you they isolate you. Uh, in my case, you know, wind up in a place at the Hacienda Garden apartment complex that's uh, called Pig's Birthing. It's a room that's been uh, that does, you know, it, it's been flooded. It's got no carpet. It's got mold. It, it's missing a glass door. It's like it's nasty. And they got some mm. crap mattress laid on the ground. 
and that's uh you know you you know you're supposed to stay there yeah. and then uh the food gets brought out in some kind of a pan that's left over from the crew and it's stuck out on some table by the you know the uh the pool area in the middle of the property mm. you know if it gets brought out at all so it's 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 like doing everything possible to make it so to break you down basically and then the real problem was because uh i was like a higher kid what they call like uh i had already reached the ot levels i would need a special kind of auditor to give me the the interrogations i needed to leave but those those higher level auditors are worth a lot of money to the organization and they weren't being allowed to utilize them for staff members so then okay so now what do i do if you can't provide an auditor for me then what how's this supposed to work out and if i just take off i'm going to get declared a suppressive person but i got family in scientology and i don't want to be you know throw that into the whole works and lose my family and blah 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 so it takes a couple of times they break you down you, you decide you're going to go back stay and then things build up some of the stuff that built up for me the carrot was always the you know did the ot levels work well i did all the way through ot7 and i can tell you they don't work that much bullshit, right i didn't feel any different nothing nothing happened it was like come on man um so yeah so that was that was done uh i had done pretty much every course you could do just about you know I had trained as an order that I could audit people to the highest level, except for rundowns I have called, you know, the class 12, uh, the L rundowns, but everything before that I had audited other people. I knew how to audit people. It, it just, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't impressing to me. It wasn't impressive. And, uh, the other thing that was happening was it got announced one day at the staff meeting, and this was coming from David Miscavige's staff that, uh, there would be no more special schedules like old people, sick people, these kind of people could go on a reduced schedule. Uh, you know, they would, they would still be helping out, but they would still be provided with their room and, and food and all that stuff. They were on a special schedule. It was called, well, somebody got uh, the idea that they were going to just cancel that one day. And they got announced at the staff meeting, the weekly uh, staff meeting at the end of the week, there would, there'd be no more special schedules. Well, shit, I've already been in like 20 something years I'm in my 40s and I'm like, so when I when I can't do 80 hours a week, I'm just supposed to walk out of this place and like, you know, suck it up. I was like looking around and most of the people at these staff meetings, they're like so tired. And most of these guys don't even understand how the organization works. A lot of them are, they just know their area, their little bubble within the big yeah. old, you know, corporation there. And I'm like, don't these guys get it? Don't they understand the significance of what this person is announcing? I didn't really get that too many people there did. But to me, I was like, okay, that's, that's, a, you know, I need to get out of here while I'm, I'm still healthy enough to go put a future here for myself. So that was, mm -hmm. that was a key point. And yeah, those, those are the main things. They just, they built up to the point where uh, I just knew I just had to get out of there. And when I had the opportunity to go to the RPF again, I was like, yeah, send me to the RPF because the RPF has its own, uh, people that can deliver the interrogations that you need to get out of there. So I thought that's my way out. I'll go into the RPF. I'll wait a few days. I'll tell them, you know, I want to leave. They'll get you some of their own staff because the RPF is, they don't get used to make money for the organization, you know, and they'll, they'll do the interrogation. I'll get out of here. So I'm there the second day. Of course, the person that's over the RPF comes in, there's 70 of us and he's got some big announcement. He wants to tell everybody. And he's like, we're going to make a new, the person that, Within the RPF that's over the RPFers is called the bosun. <laughs> it's like <clears throat> we're gonna put. Well, I'm gonna uh, put a new bosun on you know the post, and this person is like can do this and that, blah blah blah, all these things. And I'm thinking, is this is he talking about me? And and then he's like, and this person has military background. I'm like, Phew. oh, you know, it's not me because I I never been in the military. <laughs> but then all of a sudden he announced, he says. And let's give a welcome to Matt Bash. <laughs> I'm like, are you freaking kidding? My second day in here. <laughs> These guys have been on, in as an average of seven years. Those guys, seven year average of the people that were in that that RPF. And uh, wow. I mean, you got to realize these people, even if their kids and their wife or husband lives in the next apartment building over for the last seven years, they never got to see them. Mm. They never got to hold them, touch them, nothing zero 
These people are totally segregated. Any communication to them comes in writing. It gets mm-hmm. side-checked to be allowed to be passed to them, which means it has no real information in it. Any information out gets side-checked. It can't have any information in it. Mm-hmm. And they have to run every place they go. They eat the shittiest food. They sleep in overcrowded dorms. They have security guards outside their building, outside their, uh, the, the, the complex itself is fenced in. You got a guard roving. You got a guard at the booth. You shake that fence. Spotlights go off. Alarms go off. People chase you down. You know, it's not a freaking joke, man. And these people are being, they have less rights. They they have no access to TV, radio, magazine, newspaper, nothing. These people are completely shut off from the world. And they're, that's worse, way worse than if they had committed a friggin' major crime. You know, they could have, they could have robbed the store with a gun and, and had less time and had more rights. They're in there under these circumstances. Some of these people wound up being in there for 13 freaking years. I mean, I mean, the only reason I got out is because me and Amy, after we got out of the Sea Org, flapped it so hard that they had to let out these guys that were in there for like 12, 13 years because it was we made such a, a, a situation out of it. But no, they were just keeping these people in forever as slave, basically. And uh, yeah, anyway, so I was like, that's, I was so done. Man. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I had to basically like lay the law down and get out of there. I was going to say, so how did you finally get out? Well, um, me and Amy got, they call twins. Two people get put together and you're supposed to get each other through the program, right? Okay. So uh, I got asked, do you know Amy? Yeah, I know Amy. We've we've been friends since 1983. You know, we we worked together. And uh, she's OT7, you're OT7, so we want to make you guys twins. Okay, good. Okay. Well, Amy's there, but there's no way she's ever going to get off that RPF. She's... There's a there's a already a suppressive person declare on hold in her folder because she's witnessed David Miscarriage beating the crap out of people uh, repetitively, and I mean choking, kicking, punching, you know, and then even uh, taken to another level where people are uh, tied to a freaking chair, slapped with a, a, a fly swatter till the face swells up, uh, put underneath you know, the air conditioning unit while they're getting a water poured over them so that they go into hypothermia. I mean, we're talking freaking torture and she's witnessed that kind of stuff right. and they don't want her on the outside to speak about it. So she ain't going to get out of there. We both know she, she ain't going to get out of there. We both know we don't want to be there. So I said to her, all right, let's, let's get out of here. I wanted to just walk down and say, let's get out of here. And she was, you know, it's hard to do that when you've been in there for over 25 years. These are your friends. You feel like you're you're doing something bad. You're uh, letting everybody down. You got all these things that have been built into your brain, you know, that the only reason somebody wants to leave the group is because they've done bad things. Um, you know, only a degraded being would want to leave the Sea Org. I mean, there's all these things that have been put in place. Besides the fact that because we both worked at the international base, Hubbard had written that anybody who doesn't make it from the international base is supposed to get declared a suppressive person. Well, it doesn't get done all the time, but that's still there. And so we both kind of figured we're going to get declared no matter what. When we get out of here, we're going to lose our families because she had family in Scientology, Scientology, so did I. But I said, okay, you know, we're going to get out of here. And she agreed, we're going to get out of here. But she wanted to do it in such a way that it was more, she was trying to get them to kick her out. She said they, she had a fitness board meeting coming up. They were going to like do a hold a fitness board and all uh, the RPF is one by one and they to see if you qualify to even stay in the CO. So she said she was going to say, you know, how, you know, she didn't really qualify for the CO or whatever and hope they would kick her out. And the more she would say that she didn't qualify, <clears throat> the more they thought it was a good indicator that she really did qualify. Right. And made it even more qualified. <laughs> so she comes back and she tells me that I said, okay, that's it. I said, that was your plan. We, you know, we're going to plan B now. My plan is, we just, we're going to just get out of here. We're just going to tell them we're going to get out of here. So we walk down and we say, yeah, you know, we, we want to leave. We get separated. We put on the guard, individual, you know, all these, all the steps of the guard stuff. They start to give me my interrogations. I can tell after like, it's going on for like six weeks. Um, I can tell that they're never going to let me out. This is just a stall. The way they were asking the questions, how they, what the whole thing was being run was going to go on forever. It was never going to be any point of it. And so I just, and the, I just had enough and I took the cans. They were recording it and 
the interrogation recordings were sent to Dave Miscavige's staff when it was when we finished each day. Okay. And I just took the cans and I threw them, threw them down and I said, that's the fuck it. I said, that's it. I said, I'm done. I said, I'm out of here. I said, if Amy and I aren't out of here by two, you know, by noon tomorrow afternoon, I'm gonna walk out of here with her. You don't have a gate, you don't have a fence, you don't have a security guard that can stop me. I said, if you want to stop me, you're gonna have to shoot me in the fucking head. And I got up and I walked out of there. And that's that's what I mean. I put the law down. I wasn't playing. Like playtime was over, and right. they knew it. And uh, long story short, we were out of there before noon the next day. Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. So quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, oh, very yeah. nice. Very nice. Um, okay. And then what happens? So, uh, I mean, and let me ask, let me ask the question a little bit better than, and then what happens? Cause it's a little bit. <laughs> uh, so you guys are out of there before noon the next day. And um, I know for, is that when you ended up in, in Seattle, Seattle or how did, how did that, how did that part of the story go? They put her, they take her to the airport you get five hundred dollars severance pay when you leave after you know twenty seven years, you know, and uh, thanks, like, woohoo! <laughs> yeah. But you don't get this; you don't really actually get that money. What happens is they take that five hundred bucks and they buy whatever transport is needed to get you the heck out of as far away as they can, right? Okay. After they make you sign all kinds of paperwork, while videoed, notarized, all this stuff that you will never come back to Clearwater, you will never talk to. Anybody that's a, not Scientology, but that you met through Scientology, any of the, you know, the, the, the vendors and things like that, um, you sign a paper that you, they put this whole thing together, but you've been like just a, a complete piece of shit your whole freaking career. You never produce anything, you know, and that you're there on your own determinism, that you really loved it. And you sign all this stuff. You want, you got to sign it because you just, all you want is just the thing to end. You want to get out of there. And you'll just sort the rest out. Of course, I'm coming back to Clearwater. My freaking sisters live there, you know? It's like, <laughs> right. you know, and plus, you're not going to tell, you know, just stupid. But anyway, I sound all the crap. They put Amy on a plane. They send it to Seattle. It takes almost all that 500 bucks. She's got a little change left over. Before she's going to go return home after over 25 years to her family out of the blue, she doesn't want to look like she just came out of a prison camp, which she did. So she has to stop and get her hair cut and stuff like that. Which she does, which takes up the last like little bits of money she had left over after the plane ticket. They put me on a Greyhound bus to my parents' place, which was it's which is in Florida, about twenty five miles from uh, from uh, the Fort Harrison in Clearwater. Big surprise! I'm there at the Greyhound bus station. I call my parents. I said, "Hey, uh, can you pick me up? I'm at the the Greyhound bus station." I said, "I'm out of the sewer." They go, "They were never in Scientology." They said, "You're out." And they say, yeah, I'm out. They go, out, out? And I said, yeah, I'm out, out. And they were like, so they came and got me. Uh, long story short, me and Amy, actually, uh, I still thought, wasn't sure Amy was really out of the hacienda. And I asked my dad, who was, you know, uh, not somebody to play games with. You know, he, he didn't like Scientology. And he had already been, you know, spent time in Okinawa and all those places in the Pacific fighting the nastiest battles imaginable. And he's a really nice guy, but he could be a really bad guy sure. if he wants to be. And I said, Dad, can you drive me to the Hacienda Gardens? I think the girl I'm trying to leave with named Amy is still held in there, and we may need to break her, break her out. And he says, whatever you want to do. He's like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, let's go do it. You know. <laughs> so I'm like, well, luckily, uh, she was able to make contact by phone with me within a, a couple hours of me getting, being out of there. Otherwise, it would have been a real problem at the Scientology place the next day. So my dad, uh, well, obviously, was going to drive me there. I bought a plane ticket once I knew Amy was in Seattle. The next day, I flew to Seattle, and uh, we stayed at her uh, her uh, dad's house. Okay. He had a guest room, and we the fir very first day we took a bus into Seattle to get a, a marriage certificate so we can get married. <laughs> They said you got to wait like a week or something, like a few days before you, you can get it. They put you a little cooling off period, you know. Sure. And the earliest day was going to be March 13th, which is L. Ron Hubbard's birthday. And we kind of laughed. It was just <laughs> ironic. That's right. And, uh, but we thought, yeah, we thought, you know, we're never going to forget what day we got married because it's March 13th. And <laughs> we wound up having a, a real simple ceremony in her dad's backyard with a couple of relatives. And yes. it, it was a beautiful day. 
uh, we went to the Yellow Pages, hired some guy to come and be the, you know, the minister. And uh, the dad bought a nice little chocolate cake. It was, we had a, a, it was a great little deal. And then uh, we went, we got a, a little job, you know, one of these places you walk in and they'll just set you up with work right away. We did that. We we're doing great. Got mm -hmm. some paychecks, got an apartment. And then we figured out a whole business we could run ourselves. And we started making a bunch of money right away. We was we were making real good money. Nice. And uh, things took off from there. Fantastic. And then so you're there for how many years are you in uh, in the Seattle area? Let's see. We were, I don't know, I'm just going to estimate, probably was uh, maybe five years, something like that. Okay. okay. We were renting a house at one point with a big shop, and I was getting, I had a big box truck, and I was going to three different auctions a week. And each auction, I would fill the box truck up with uh, household furniture, and I'd bring it back to the shop, fix it up a little bit, whatever's needed, take a picture of it, do a write-up, give it to Amy. She would post it. Uh, the people would either pick it up at our place or I would deliver it. Amy gave me a you know, delivery route. I would drop off all this furniture. Sure. But what happened was uh, the house we were renting, the, we weren't dealing with the guy himself. We were dealing through uh, like a management company okay. on the rental. Yeah. And one day the banker shows up, somebody from the bank shows up and says, hey, you know, I hate to go direct to you guys, but we can't find the guy who owns this place because what happened was at the top of the housing market, people people were buying houses. And then as the market was going up, 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 they were making profit on it. But then when the market crashed in 2008, um, these people were holding on to property that wasn't you know worth holding on to. And, that's, mm -hmm. and they just kind of run off of whatever money they had gotten out of that house so far. And that's what, what that house was about. So we had like one week we were supposed to like have the whole place cleaned out, which we did all our equipment, all our furniture, all our personal stuff. We got it all down to what would fit in one SUV that we owned. And we decided to head on off to Florida. And mainly because uh, Amy at that time was having trouble getting, uh, she was having trouble with her body, having trouble getting warm, these kind of things. And so I thought, well, if you're having trouble getting warm, let's start off in Florida. Plus I have family there. And uh, yeah, so we went there. It got interesting. I mean, we went into one of these places in Florida, like walk-in clinics. You know, you can imagine what walks in for free in those walk-in clinics in Florida. We went in there, and uh, they did a blood test for Amy, and the guy said it was the worst results he had ever seen. He said, you you don't change something quick. You, you're you not going to be alive. Because she was having trouble. Like, she didn't know what was going on, but she was swelling up. She couldn't get warm. She couldn't lift her arms above her head. She couldn't tap her foot. To music. I mean, she, her body was, like, shutting down. And uh, so they found out what it was, and she had she has a prescription that she has to take, uh, you know, thyroid, thyroid, whatever it is. Anyway, she's got a, a prescription. She got healthy from there. We switched things up. But, yeah, that's kind of how we wound up in Florida and of course Scientology freaked the frig out, man, that we, not only did we move back to Florida, but we were going to be more central to start doing some uh, furniture flipping again, but we didn't like the auctions that they had there. And the, the auction that we did like was close to Clearwater. So we wound up renting an apartment out on Clearwater beach, which was great right on the water. <laughs> it was great for us. Oh Scientology yeah. Scientology did not like it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they weren't crazy. We had, we had a whole team of private investigators that overtly harassed us day and night. And if we took a trip back to Seattle to visit family, they took the trip back to Seattle. Oh. You know, it was it was intense. But anyway, that's, that'll all be in the book. Is that uh, has that tapered, or are you guys still? The last time they were really strong about it was we were outside Seattle. Um, and they were they had this guy that was they were had this PI he came and he was sitting out in front of our house and and uh there was a, a bus stop there where the little kids would get on the school bus, you know, like yeah. the elementary school age. Sure. So I went I went out there and I said, Hey man, I said, I see you eyeballing these kids, you know. I said, I know you're not from the neighborhood, and uh, you know, it's not okay that you're out here waiting for these little kids, you know. So I, I'm not here for the kids. I said, Yeah, I'm, yeah, right. So I I, he goes, I'm married, right? I go, yeah, that's even worse, right? <laughs> so I got on, I had the cell phone, and I called 
the police and I gave his, his license plate number and I said, Hey, I got some guy that doesn't belong in the neighborhood and he's out here every day watching these little kids. <laughs> guy freaked out. He drove off. He got out of there. But the next day, a different PI comes back, right? So they, they've switched out this guy because he doesn't want to be part of this. I don't know what his, yeah. his thing was, but he didn't want to be part of it anymore. They gave him a new PI to sit outside now. So I said, okay. I was like, that's it. I walked out there and I said, can you pass on a message? He said, pass on a message to who? Like, like, yeah, like, yeah. I said, yeah, you know who. I said, tell them if you're still sitting here an hour from here, from now, that I'm selling out here and I'm moving back to Clearwater. And I said, last time I was there, I was nice. I said, I didn't cause any trouble. I said, it's going to be totally different this time. <laughs> I said, you let them know that. That was the last time I had a PI sit in front of my house. He was gone. <laughs> they did not, they had made, done such an effort to get me to move away from the base that they didn't want to cause me to move back to the base. We wound up moving back to the base anyway. That was, they had sure. tough luck, but <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't intentional. It was just the way it was. Oh, wow. And just a reminder to everybody, if you've got any questions or comments for uh, for Matt, please uh, um, post them. If you don't mind, throw the word comment or question in front of them. And uh, our wonderful uh, starring Maven in the back will uh, will catch them and get those starred. Also, uh, you know, super chats, just saying. So <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Um, so there. Um, so you've been back now, or you've been back, right? Where, where is back? You've been in you've been in Clearwater now uh, for what about three, three, four years, three, two, three years? How long? Yeah, two, the last time we came here, forty seven was uh, about three years ago. Because okay, what happened was my mom, my dad passed at ninety five years old, mm -hmm. and my mom was about uh, ninety, and you know her health obviously wasn't great, and yeah. she didn't want to wind up in some kind of facility. She didn't want to die in some hospital this kind of thing and she she we talked on the phone and i said okay i i talked to amy i said hey you know why don't we just sell our house we'll move in with my mom you know and help her out to the end of her life and that's what we did we we sold the house right away you know within a couple of weeks we were with my mom sure. we stayed with her for nine months through thick and thin amy was a real trooper taking care of my mom and uh my mom finally passed in her own bed and we were done. So then we were like, okay, well, now what do we want to do? You know, we can go any place. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to stay in Florida. So we went, we bought a house about 20 miles from uh, downtown Clearwater, a nice area. And we know, we know the public side of what you guys have been doing since then, but, uh, um, has that, I mean, I, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to dive too deep in. I don't want to ask too much that's, uh, that's, you know, going to be exclusive to the book. And, uh, but, uh, so you've been back, you've been, you've been public about Scientology. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Amy put out a book, you know, Scientology Abuse at the Top. She wrote that when we were in, uh, at Clearwater Beach. Yeah. And uh, we were part of that whole thing with uh, with the St. Pete Times, Truth Revealed, right. that whole thing. And they were putting out all those articles that were winding up on the cover of Sunday, yeah. the Sunday newspaper, Tampa Bay Times. Um, you know, one day I had gotten a, uh, there was a, a message came in on the computer and Amy read it to me. And I said, I said, that's either Marty Rathbun or somebody pretending to be Marty Rathbun. Hmm. And Marty Rothman was supposed to be dead. There was literally uh, a death certificate available that was on the computer for Marty Rothman. Oh. And I said, I said, okay, listen, ask, ask this person these questions that only Marty and me would know. You know, like, how do we get back from Mexico? <laughs> you know, what were we drinking? <laughs> um, <clears throat> these kind of questions. And so he answered them all right away. They were all correct. It was obviously Marty. <laughs> so I said, okay, good. We bought a, a ticket. And like one day later, we were at his place down in Texas. And I told Amy, I said, you know, I don't know if he's going to even want to talk about Scientology. I said, so just, you know, just, we'll just play it real easy. You know, let's see, 
see what's up here. Right. And uh, so we, we rented his place right next to where he was living. And uh, in the morning, he's calls. He's all excited. You know, he's awake. And we go over there. All he wants to talk about is Scientology. He hasn't been able to talk to a Scientologist for like whatever, a year or two or something. And he's just, blah, you know, <laughs> just laying it all out. <laughs> we just had a great time. We had a great time. Um, we went fishing every day. We stayed there for about a week or something. We were playing board games, barbecuing. You know, it was, it was just, it was fun. And Marty, you know, as he was learning that uh, I was cut off from my brother, and the, and the whole disconnection routine and stuff like that, it kind of got to him, you know, and he, he really felt that he wanted to speak out and do something uh, about this whole disconnection thing. And that's really when he kind of stepped out publicly and he's the one that arranged the, uh, the interviews with the St. Pete times and all that stuff. And he even said to us, you guys, okay. you, you guys can be involved if you want. He said, if you don't want to be involved with it, it's fine too. I could totally understand that. And we were like, no, no, well, you know, we'll be involved. And, uh, so Amy was doing those interviews and we were, we were helping uh, the uh, guys that were writing the articles at the, the St. Pete times, which became the Tampa Bay times. Yeah. They were getting, they had so many kind of strings and reaches for people who would want to, to speak out, but they weren't sure who was what and what was fake and what was a good story. And so we obviously knew all of that and we said, okay, you, you know, we were literally sitting for breakfast at a restaurant with them, and we say, "This person, this person, this person. These are the people you want to contact for your for your stories." So they would contact them, and you know, and they would call back and say, "Well, this person doesn't want to talk," you know, because you know, and I, you understand, you get out, and you're just trying to restart your life. You don't really want to wake up the big, you know, tiger in the room, and put them back on you and stuff like that. You're just trying to get on with your life, and but anyway. I said, okay, give me a minute. I'd, I'd, I'd call him, you know, like Don Jason with his man overboard article that he did, uh, how he escaped from the free winds. And I talked to Don, we're good friends. And uh, I got his agreement. He said, okay, despite everything, he'll he'll put his neck out. He'll get the article out. It's important enough. I'd call back the St. Pete Times. I'd tell him, call Don. He's ready, to, he's ready to go. And then that would happen. It would happen with the next person, next person. So he was helping to set up uh, the reporters with the, the, the correct people and the correct stories that they really needed to uh, get put out publicly. And then Amy was going on, uh, she went to Anderson Cooper show. She was on radio shows. She, we, right. she was doing uh, radio with major shows from Canada. She flew over to Europe. She, she was, uh, you know, with, with Mark Headley and some others that were speaking out at some kind of conference there that Germany was putting on about Scientology. That's right. There was all kinds of people from other countries, uh, from Europe that were there representing their countries, their their police departments, their kind of things. And they, they wanted to speak to Amy and the others and, you know, find out what the deal was. Hungary was a key one. Some other Eastern European countries, they, they all, they, you know, they knew the history of Scientology and they were, they didn't, weren't really happy about it taking root in their country and causing more damage to their people. And so Amy was there, to, and, the, and Mark Headley and a bunch of other guys were there to uh, answer those kind of questions. And I don't know. So it's, it's you know, I've had phone calls where the IRS, the FBI, and Homeland Security were all on the line together to ask me questions about the finances of Scientology and various different information things that I had. Mm. So we were always open to give the help, you know. Uh, Amy and I spent each spent a day with the FBI. It was all recorded, answered all their questions, gave them all kinds of information. Uh, a lot of the other guys had the same thing, you know. Uh, what happened was when guys were speaking out and saying David Miscavige was doing all these beatings, well, somebody had the bright idea in Scientology to put together affidavits from senior executives at the international base saying it wasn't David Miscavige. It was the person speaking out who was doing the beatings, you know, and they would they would uh, give all this information like on the penalty of you know perjury that they had witnessed these people choke, beat, do this, thought they was going to kill the guy and you know, take five guys to pull him off, blah, blah, blah. And they they put all these affidavits together. And it was like I said, holy crap, what else do you need? What else do you need as evidence that there's a situation 
at the international level of Scientology that needs outside into you know intervention. Yeah. You know, if, if if they could handle it themselves, they would have handled it themselves. Obviously, this is something that's routine there because these are the top guys, and they're not doing anything about it, and they're participating in it. So I said, just pack that whole damn thing up and send it over to the FBI, which we did, which <laughs> helped get that whole investigation from the FBI launched. So anyway, we've done all kinds of stuff to try to get this stuff exposed. And then, you know, wow. Amy, you know, the uh, Scientology in the Aftermath show with Leah Remini, that was the pilot for that was done at our house in Seattle. And uh, mm, Amy's right. story with her mom was episode one, season one. Yeah. So that kind of helped launch that. And both of us were on other episodes over the three years that that show was running. So I remember. Got, yeah, I remember. So I remember. Much, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm just talking over. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. What are you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, I remember you being uh, in later in the season um, with Mike and Leah kind of talking the, I think you were talking the finances, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, there was, there was one show. Yeah, it was about the finances. That's right. No, I do yeah. remember that. So, um, and then we're and then we're here. <laughs> yeah. So what do you say? Aside from aside from getting uh, getting behind the camera on some live streams and some uh, some recordings, what just uh, you just kicking back uh, fishing? What's uh, what's what's yeah, what's Matt? Do, what's what's Matt doing? No, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you doing? What else you got going on here? You you you've always been a a mover, well, a shaker, and a guy who likes to to get around. So. Well, I pick up odd jobs, you know, doing carpet laying, painting, all these kind of things, like I've always done. But mostly it's for people I know and stuff. Okay. Uh, I also work for Mark Headley's company, Mode Systems. Um, we go and do the audiovisual for Challenger Space and Education Centers. There's like over 40 of them now in the United States. Um, that many? Okay. Wow. Also different museums. We've done a few museums. Uh, right. you know, and the work is you'll, you'll work for a few weeks, then you have some time off, you know, mm -hmm. could be weeks, could be a couple of months, whatever. And during that time, I mainly been doing, uh, driving Uber because it allows me, it's the kind of work you can start and stop. It also makes me feel like I don't, I don't have to answer to anybody. I can just right. my own schedule. I work whenever I want. Right. So I feel retired. I mean, we don't have any house payment. We paid cash for our house. Beautiful. Uh, we got plenty of money stashed away and, uh, you know, life is good. Life is good. And really quick, back to uh, the Challenger Education uh, Museum things. Um, just for anybody that doesn't know, um, tell us how those are kind of linked to the family. You know, it's uh, they're linked, but it wasn't like intentional, funny enough. I mean, mm -hmm. Amy's uncle was uh, Dick Scobie, the commander of the Challenger space shuttle that blew up with the teacher on it. Yep. That's her dad's brother. And his wife, June, has worked with NASA to set up these space and education centers. And the, the original challenger was there with the teacher on it to help get kids interested in science and space and all that stuff. So his wife wanted to continue that hmm. uh, and have a way to get kids interested in science and, and space. And these challenges, space and education centers, was the answer to that. And they're, they're big. They're sophisticated. Um, you know, kids go in there, they get a briefing room, they get a transport room, they get uh, cool. a launch room, you know, all these, you know, mission control. So they move around, it's computers, it's a lot of visual sound. It's it's exciting. They're really nice. And uh, yeah. a lot of school trips go there. And uh, so Mark's company, he got the uh, contract to put the audio visual in for those, for the uh, Challenger Space and Education Centers. It just happens to be that, you know, Amy's family's tied into that. So they really like that also because we would go to these jobs and people would be like, see Amy and go, oh, you know, like you're actually, you know, fix Scobie's niece, you know. And it, it was just a real good door open on that. And uh, it's been fun. Even even all the museums have been fun. Working with the guys is always fun. I love working with a, a crew and the guys are good. And it's just it's just been fun it's not like work it's it's really like paid vacations that's how we, we look at it because amy goes on a lot of them too with me so yeah it's very fun. cool very cool i come from a generation that will never forget uh january 28th 1986 86 yeah yeah that was uh yeah i was uh, my story and then we'll get to the questions uh <laughs> i was in i was in choir 
my teacher came down and to, to pick us up and said, just so I just have to tell you all and, and explain to us. And we went back up into the classroom and I spent the next I spent the rest of the day staring in front of like a 19 inch television set watching the, you know, in the library, watching the news, watching the, the rerun. So there was there was no school that day. We were all in school. But I don't think anybody tried to teach anything to uh, to uh, anybody. So that was uh, that was a sad day. So yes, it uh, that's that's a great um, uh, a memorial um, symbol, something to be to be uh, to be done in in the honor of uh, of the teacher of Krista McAuliffe and and of yep. Dick Scobie and, and that entire crew and. Uh, yeah, just kind of a it's it's just kind of a cool link there to that story. So yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Matt. That so that brings us to that kind of brings us to today. I mean, there's always more happening, in, you know. I'm sure, but uh, uh, I let's let's see what these questions are since I know we're to, yep. we're, at, we're about at the two hour mark here, and I don't want to hold you up too long today. Yep. Um, we've got a great question from Pamela Crawford. I was wondering how your, uh, how your brother and sister got involved in Scientology. Is that? Unfortunately, they kind of followed me when I was got into it and I got curious about it and they went and, uh, to the local mission and they did some little courses and things like that. So that's kind of how they, they got their foot in the door. They kind of just curi curiosity following me. That's it. All right. Um, Katura, I did not. I am uh, I am one of the never in, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, why does this rich cult, <laughs> lots of money there, uh, have such crappy accommodations? I if if I may, it just sounds like that's the well. I don't know. I don't. I understand for people who are trying to leave, it helps. You you mentioned it, break them down, kind of you know, but. For a for a normal staff member, for somebody or a normal Sea Org member who's who's there every day busting their butt, yeah, why why such crappy accommodations? It's it's just totally greed. It's really greed. Uh, the organization does not only tries to like suck every ounce of energy out of its staff members, it does the same to the public. It's trying to grab whatever they can get any money any extra work out of them their children whatever it's like mm -hmm. it's like the black hole of greed that's and that's that's the truth of it it just yeah that's what it is it's just sucking 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 there's never enough never enough did you feel that greed was a was a component in those early years that 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 day when you got uh uh when you ended up at uh at essentially big blue and and we're living in a crappy accommodation did you find that to be greed or to be uh, i don't know i didn't I don't know, know what to find it really i didn't know what to find it you know okay. what i mean i was so yeah. unaware of the overall situation the overall scene where this thing was what it could do where it led what other organizations there were i didn't even like i said i didn't even know there was flag you know i didn't know right. there was more than one place i didn't i didn't know nothing i was like Literally, anybody who's watching the show knows a thousand times more than I know when I walked in that place. And I can tell you, I still wasn't a Sea Org member five years later. When I went home on vacation, I hitchhiked up to uh, up to uh, Canada, up to Niagara Falls to see a girlfriend up there that I used to hitchhike with. And when I came back, my friend who owned was a captain of one of the uh, the fishing boats at a cap tree in Long Island, he took me out, you know, the the fish for free. And as a gift, I gave him a half an ounce of pot. You know, I mean, I was that was after five years in New York. I mean, hmm. I hadn't I hadn't done any. I was like, I was still a non Scientologist for for all right. you know purposes. You know, <laughs> I had never gotten any ordering. I was you know, I was a construction worker in Scientology. I just was working mostly just building and renovating from morning to night. And yeah, so I was yeah, I wasn't even what you would call a Scientologist. I didn't know anything about anything so that ties into this question here from deviant outcast matt getting into the the sea org not being a scientologist did you ever become a true believer or a believer at all 
If so, what factored in? Oh, there's more there. Sorry, it uh, scrolled off the screen. Uh, if so, what factored in? Uh, pure mental gymnastics, uh, slow force over time. <laughs> so, first thing, were you ever were you ever a true believer? Sure. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And then, so yeah, what factored into what? What what got you it's to a that process. point? It's a process in and it's a process out. And the process out is still happening to this day, to say the truth. And the okay. process in, it starts with you're doing some little little course and you're supposed to, at the end of class, you're supposed to stand up and clap to L. Ron Hubbard pitcher, right? And at first that thing was really weird, but after a while you kind of get used to it. The other thing is if you disagree with anything, you can't disagree with it if it was written by L. Ron Hubbard. It means you just, there's something, some word you don't understand, something you don't understand, because the right answer is L. Ron Hubbard's answer. And that kind of like gets ingrained into you at time, at, as you go along, right? Yeah. And then you're constantly being told that Scientology is doing all kinds of incredible stuff, right? You're, you're in a bubble. There's any, any cult has, at the heart of it, is information control. And so you, you're not seeing the outside picture. You're not seeing what's really happening. You're just being fed information that's being fed to you through the, the cult itself. And what Scientologists are being told all the time is that we would be told that, uh, you know, the uh, the study technology was spreading through Africa like the fire across the the, the Sahara plain, you know, the grass plains, or you know, yeah. that uh, organizations, big companies wanted, you know, Scientology technology that we were taking over mental health, that we were handling. Mm -hmm the drug abuse in different cities that the crime that was happening in some city, Los Angeles had, you know, the gang wars had stopped because of Scientology passing out its stupid little uh, way to happiness magazines that, you know, it just, you, you just, you know, the, the, the prisoners down in the worst prisons in Mexico have now like, you know, tiptoeing through the tulips down there because of Scientology, you know, you're, you're yeah, getting yeah, yeah. Shit <laughs> like four times a year all the time like for years so you're just you're believing that somehow the hard work you're doing is actually changing the world helping people you 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 fully believe that mm -hmm. and you know and you've been fed so much false information about l ron hubbard and all these things that he's done and you believe it you don't think you're being lied to you you think you, you this is your group you think the group is like you're you're getting fed this is supposed to be like uh a really ethical group and stuff, you know. So you're you're sucking everything down and believing it. It's not until you get out that you really start peeling off, and you almost don't even want to peel. It's like painful almost, you know. You're like, okay, so yeah, I know Miscavige was crazy, and he, you know, but you know, and then you go a little deeper and deeper, and then you're like, oh, should I look to see what Hubbard was about? Ugh. And then you start peeling that, and you're like, oh shit, the whole thing was, you know, and it's. It's a it's a whole process. It's a whole process getting in. It's a whole process coming out, and then your whole mindset that you've been geared to, uh, which I kind of pull apart in the book. You gotta you're constantly trying to pull it out. And I can tell you, veteran Sea Org members, they go for years, decades with nightmares. And the might you know the, there's all kinds of key ones, but one of the most common of those nightmares is the whole process of trying to get out of there. And then you wake up and you think you you have a dream that you've somehow gotten back into the Sea Oak. And you're like, I told myself I'd never go back. What the hell am I doing back? You know what I mean? And you can talk to any veteran Sea Oak member come out. And they've had that dream many, 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 many times. It's it's uh, <laughs> sure it's it's intense. It's friggin intense. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh... <laughs> Take a drink anytime, Matt says, you know, oh, yeah, you'd be floating. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love that uh, <laughs> everybody has their own drinking game. I love that. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> uh, here's a great question um, from OBG Foster. Um, what advice do you have for a person starting over in life? Uh, OBG got laid off last week, uh, not broke, but starting over, so. Any any advice from what you've experienced from what you've dealt I with? I think um, I think something that's really helpful if you're kind of starting off like that is to be teamed up with somebody, you know, because you can really feel alone when you don't have anything. And if you have a, some kind of partnership, somebody that's working with you, um, 
you, there's strength in that. And it, it gives you more confidence and it gives you more options to be able to, to build yourself up and your situation up from nothing. And that's the first thing I would say is try to find somebody trustworthy, somebody that, that is willing to work um, that you could team up with. And, and that's, you know, that will work with you thick and thin. And uh, you guys just start it up. So you got to get, you got to, you know, I always say this uh, opportunity ain't going to come find you. Usually you need to get yeah. your butt out and find it. You need to make yourself available. You know, even if you start from the scratch, even if it's flipping a hamburger, you know, get into an environment where you can then talk and meet other people. See, and then you can start finding those opportunities to build up from. Um, just sitting in your house or watching TV, that there ain't gonna be no opportunity coming knocking on your door. Not likely. So yeah, you gotta, you know, that's that's what I would say. And just take what you can get, get your foot in the door, work it. If you work hard, if you're honest, you work hard. You'd be surprised. Companies look at you and go, "Wow, that guy has value just from the fact that you, you like to work, you want to work, that you're honest, that you're there on time, you come early, whatever. Those kind of things mean a lot to somebody who's looking to hire people for their company, and uh, that will help you. I mean, we were, we were, we got out. And the first thing we were doing was uh, working for a box company, and we're there with staple guns, and we're putting together these boxes and all this kind of stuff. But we were happy to be there. <laughs> We were happy. We were enjoying ourselves. We were working hard. And they literally brought out the head guy of the company that was watching us because it was so unusual because the other people that were coming in from the job service, they were like in resentment. You know, they were dragging their ass around and they didn't want to be there. And they thought they should just get paid because they showed up. And it was that kind of a thing. And we, we, that wasn't our viewpoint. And right away, they wanted to make us managers, you know, of the, of this box company. It was a big box company. It was a major company. And we were like, yeah, no, you know, thank you. But we you know we had some other opportunities breaking loose at that point, which which we then jumped on. But but yeah, that's what I would say. Great advice. Great advice. Um, <laughs> uh, Duchess Diana would like to know if Matt had long hair when he'd start when he was hitchhiking. I'm going to have Amy put a picture up. <laughs> I didn't have long hair. But I had, you know, typical in the 70s, you know, you'd have the hair that was like over your ears kind of thing. I had that kind of hair. No, I didn't have it down my back kind of <laughs> stuff. No. Love it. Uh, no, I was going to ask another hair question, but I, I, will, <laughs> I will avoid the hair questions as a reason for this hat. Um, I love this. Matt, uh, Matt never said what jobs he did inside. There's tons of stories with that. Uh, but we'll save the, we'll save it for his book and for other videos. Absolutely, Amy. I didn't. I don't want to steal all the content, and uh, um, knew that I wouldn't uh, be able to even so. So, without yeah, a doubt, there's so been... much. This there's so much to cover. I could never. I can never even start to chip at it in, in two hours. Believe me. Understood. Uh, Marilyn says, loving this interview uh, from the starring Maven in the back. There she is. <laughs> Great. Thank you, you all can't see her. Um, I'm going to say there's a couple of questions. Glenda had a question for me. Kimberly had a question for me. There's been a few of them uh, about me as a never in. Um, I, I'm not going to address those here, uh, partly for time, partly uh, this is Matt's story, but uh, um, if you join, if you come back to this channel at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time for this Saturday's episode of Zenu Nation, uh, I will address those questions. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for asking them. But uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, me as an Everin and what got me here and all that. Uh, uh, we'll do that tonight. So if you're over on Queen BSP and you haven't uh, swung over to subscribe to at Denver Stevo yet, please come on over and do. Um, yeah, I won't. Pay yeah, we want pay. as many channels as possible out there getting the message out. And that he's a never in that he's doing this, I think, is fantastic. Oh, and uh, we need to like need to push him along, help him along. Thank you. So come yeah. on over. Yeah, we've got. Uh, it doesn't we've got... cost anything to subscribe. You just click on his subscribe button and uh, right. it just helps him out. That's right. And I promise if I ever do a show uh, at the same time as Matt or Amy do <laughs> on their channel, you can always catch it on the replay. But uh, just to make sure you get those notifications, 
uh, of when those Denver Stevo shows are. Come on over, subscribe, make sure that little bell thingy is saying, "Hey, I'm sending you things." Come on over. We're uh, we're we're a warm we're a warm and loving family over here. So. Yeah, and um, the notification but, is just a little line across the top of your phone for like one second, and it disappears. It's just it's not gonna it's not gonna upset your life. Not at all. So thank you, thank you. Uh, here's a great question from uh, from Purple Groovy sixty nine. Love you, Purple Groovy. I haven't seen you in ten minutes here, Matt. You've got so many stories. Your book is going to be thicker than a dictionary. <laughs> yeah, probably. I, I think my yeah. answer to that is no, no, no. It's going to be multiple books. Right. Who's we'll, see, it? we'll see. Amy Who's just it? keeps saying, just keep writing. Just keep writing. Just keep writing. So. Well, what is it? Janice that has two already. And I think, uh, I think she's, I don't know if she's working on a third, but, uh, you can just break the, the, the story up that way. Um, <laughs> parallel Jen says great interview guys. Thank you. Parallel Jen. Thank and, you. uh, last one, uh, from love it two hours has flown by well love it i'm going to tell you it's been two hours 11 minutes and 59 seconds now <laughs> there we go so it has flown by it yeah, absolutely has no with the, it sure has thank you um i would love to once uh you know and, and i don't know what I, I i'm not asking and i don't know what your time frame is i would love to have you back after the book is out and uh Oh, for sure. For but sure. Uh, but if that's going to be a while, I'd love to have you back before the book is on, and we can uh, we can explore that gap that we missed, and and at least address a few of those stories there. So sure. Yeah. Um, and again, and again, to to the uh, to the to the director hiding in chat. Uh, uh, no, we will not. <laughs> we will not steal the. Uh, we will not steal the uh, the the gems of the book, but uh, <laughs> I, I absolutely love this. This was wonderful. So, Matt, thank you, and thank you to everybody that joined. I think at one point we had uh, we were we were pushing uh, four hundred people live uh, in the uh, in the audience, and then we're still at over wow. three hundred and fifty. So, um, thank you to everybody that on a on a on a. I depending on where you're from, it may be a snowy Saturday afternoon, it may be a hot and 80s uh, 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 lakes, lake sailing, lake, what was it? What were they? Lake skiing, uh, jet skiing, uh, <laughs> losing my words, uh, jet skiing afternoon. But wherever you're from in the, the U.S. and in the continental world of Xenu Nation, um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. It's been wonderful. So, yep. Uh, and with that, hey. I'm going to, yeah, with that, I'm going to kick up a, a cool little, Superman icon and uh, uh, because, you know, origin stories and all. And uh, we'll be off. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Stay safe.